But let's just say we sell this for $50 billion. What we would want to do is buy islands right next to each other. John Shahidi, the secret mastermind behind Full Send, Happy Dad, and Now. Earnings from his business ventures are estimated to be around 800 million. And he's here today to share the secrets behind his success. When we launched Happy Dad two and a half years ago, people were, were terrified of creators. There was no proof of concept yet. We did a collab with Snoop Dogg. We actually sold out all in one day. Most people who launch products, they don't do this. It's not just having Walmart give you a chance. We're gonna probably do 100 million can sales this year. Happy Dad to me is a speed train. It's going a thousand miles an hour. Are you building to sell? It's a very good question that I love answering. A lot of the success comes from Kyle also being a very sharp businessman. If I were to call Kyle, I said, hey, before Drake concert, probably going to hang out with them, probably going to crack some happy dads with them. Before I do this, I need you to visit this account real quick that's about to bring on happy dad. He'll do it. Do you have any crazy untold Elon Musk stories? He's one of the realest guys out there. The people we've named that I've worked with, Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson, Justin Bieber, Jake Paul, Lele Pons, Nelk Boys. You have something in you that allows allows you to see where this space is going in the future. If you strike oil, keep drilling. Here's the blueprint. You go do it. Welcome to the podcast, John. Pleasure to have you. And I'm excited to try some of this banana happy dad. I haven't had this one yet, so we'll do a quick little taste. Yeah, test. let's crack yeah, them up before we get started. Away. That's pretty good. You can definitely taste it's the good. banana in it, can't you? You can. Yeah, I like that. So pretty much uh, everyone on YouTube knows now Full Send, Happy Dad. It's grown into this massive empire. But not many people know that you're actually the mastermind behind the scenes making things happen. So what's your role within the business and what does it entail? I came on board a few years ago to help build business around um, the Nelk empire, which I'm not the only person. I mean, I know it looks like that, but believe it or not, I think a lot of the success of Nelk really comes from Kyle also being like a very sharp businessman as well, which is so odd. And I've, I say this all the time. It's just so odd for someone. So, you know, I could call him one minute and talk about a random video idea and completely get one side of his brain on creation. And then we could both just flip the switch and get into the other side of the brain and start talking business and, you know, from logical business, analytical business, just everything. So it really takes a lot of us. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm more, I would say, you know, uh, the Nelk empire would be on the business side, me and my brother, Sam, you know, 90% of the business being us and 10% on helping on the, cre uh, on the creative side. And then Kyle, you know, maybe more, you know, on the other side, you know, uh, mm. more creative. And then when he, we need him on the business side, he comes in but he's very helpful as well. So it's, uh, you know, and Steve too, by the way, you know, it, it might not appear that way sometimes with Steve, but Steve's a sharp businessman, you know? So, you know, the business of Nelk, and it's really important too, because when you've got sharp business people and not people just trying to think they know what they're doing with business, but they really do know, but also understand create, um, the creative side too, you know, that's where you get the balance where Nelk's always pumping great content. Steve's always pumping great content. And then on, on, you know, on the backside, the business is running so we could keep the, uh, you know, the engine going as well. You know, it's not, it's not cheap to create the content that we create. Did you know you had that synergy straight away with Carl and, and um, Steve as well? And how did you chat? How did you first meet? How did it all happen? Kyle and I, we, we had followed each other on social media, but we met at a dinner. And then shortly after we just met one-on-one, -on -one. actually it was a day later, the day after we met in person, we met and, um, we hit it off right away. Like I knew it. I said, I want to work with this guy. I want to be this guy's partner. I want to, I want to be in with this guy. He's sharp. He's going to be around for a very long time. So yeah, it was, it was an instant thing. We, I didn't even have to think twice. My brother, Sam, he was at the dinner. He didn't have to think twice. We were immediately in. This is our, our first time in LA. And uh, accidentally the other day, we, we stopped on a street where 1600 miners which, as mm -hmm. you know, is a bit of a, and I was trying to explain to these guys what a, a legendary place this is in that space. Um, I was a big fan of Rudy back in the day and obviously Logan, Jake and, and everyone that lived in that sort of area. You obviously had such a massive part even back then in this creator economy and bridging that gap between creator and business. Yeah. How did you get involved in that world in the first place? Yeah, so... Um Speaking of 1600 behind, I just drove past there too. And I always get goosebumps going yeah. by there. Cause that's where a lot of this all started uh, for me at least. Um, so was the road named after the Viners or was it just a coincidence? It was a coincidence. Really? Well, not only a coincidence, Hollywood and Vine. 
uh-huh. is the corner, you know, like, you know, so, which was crazy because yeah. at the time, you know, all the Vine stars were starting to become Hollywood, mm-hmm. you know? So um, there's a book that just came out by my friend, Taylor Lorenz, and she actually talks about a lot of 1600 Vine. So I highly recommend everyone checking oh, out yeah, that okay. book. I'm drawing a blank on the name of the book, but if you search Taylor Lorenz, you'll see um, the book and there's a lot of stuff. She really understands social media. She gets a lot of hate online, but she really understands social media. And she talks about 1600 Vine and the inception of 1600 Vine really was at the time I was living in San Francisco and I saw the growth of Vine creators happening. And um, we had an app at the time, Shots app, that me, my brother and Justin Bieber had launched in 2013. So exactly 10 years ago. And during that time, our fastest growing users within the app uh, it was a photo sharing app, so it was photos only. We didn't have video. Um, we introduced video a little bit later. The fastest growing group of creators on there were these Vine creators who were using Vine for video and our app for photos. And so I started looking into this more, and I realized, you know, there, you know, there's this world of Vine, and Vine was blown up. Fast forward, and this pub- this info is public, but there were times where t- us and Twitter were discussing Twitter acquiring our app. And every time I would go to the Twitter office, I would talk about Vine creators being massive on our app. And believe it or not, even though Twitter owned Vine, they didn't give a shit. They're like, they never even heard of some of these creators. So I just knew that there was an opportunity to help the Vine creators and be a support system. And at the same time, I had this gut feeling that Vine was going to go downhill. Did you get that from having these meetings and realizing they don't seem to care? Never cared. Why didn't they get it? I don't know. It know. seems like Vine was ahead of its time, really. Like it was too early. It was ahead of their time, but I think the Twitter regime at that time, obviously, well, there is no more Twitter anymore. We're X, but mm-hmm. Twitter at that time, I think they were really caught up on like mainstream celebrities. Like they cared about the, you know, the the, the Kardashians of the world and you know the Taylor Swifts of the world, the top tier musicians and A listers on Twitter, Ashton Kutcher's. They were caught up on that. They weren't. They didn't understand this world of creators, uh, which just now people are starting to understand. Uh, people still don't fully understand. People, I, every single day, I have to explain to somebody who the Nelk Boys are and why they're so powerful. Um, every single day, I have to understand. But I mean, those who know know. Yeah. But um, but going back to Vine. So what what happened was. The deal with us and Twitter at that time didn't work out. At the time that the biggest Vine creator was King Batch, and he lived in that building. He was the only creator that lived in that building. I would fly from San Francisco all the time. That, that building is attached to W Hotel. So I would stay at the W Hotel back and forth, back and forth. And it was starting to get expensive staying at W Hotel. I said, I, I might as well just get a spot here. So I, I got a spot there at, at the 1600 Vine. Just really, honestly, to just be close to King Batch and understand this creative world. And he was always helping me out and telling me who to look at. And he was like, you know, check out this guy, Rudy Mancuso, check out this guy, Logan Paul, check out his brother, Jake Paul, check out this girl, Lele Pons, Anwar Jabawi, Hannah Stocking. Um, He and I really hit off, started working with him. And then when I realized Vine was going to be shut down, I knew, I knew about six months before Twitter was going to shut down Vine. Vine was going to be shut what down. What was the reason for shutting down Vine though? If, if it was so successful, was it just a problem with monetizing? the content on that i think monetize i think twitter introduced video at that time Mm. so they just wanted to roll everything into twitter video um it's crazy to think that they could have had like tiktok now but they just passed up on it i know Mm. it was i mean i mean that's what tiktok really is right if Mm. i mean at the time vine was six second videos square Mm. couldn't add music all they had to do is make it longer than six seconds, make it full screen and add music, uh, you know, go to the three record labels and get their catalogs. And you had TikTok right there. So, yeah. So what happened was me and Batch hit it off. And then what I did was I, I went to YouTube. I went to YouTube's headquarters and I said, hey, listen, um, I'm going to show you guys some of the, the future of content creation. And I showed them all the different creators that I just named. And I said, I really think if you guys create a create a support system for these guys, and I'll bring every single one of them into your office, these guys will be, f- be able to figure out longer than six second videos. They'll be able to, f- they're, they're smart enough to figure out one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute videos, um, and just give them a chance and give them, create this, you know, this, all they need is a support system. They need to be able to make money because these guys aren't making money on Vine and they just need some love because nobody at vine twitter at that time now twitter's i mean t- twitter's creator support system or x's creator support system something else but um which we could get into 
But anyways, YouTube was all in. How does one actually get in this situation though? Because you speak very casually about going into the YouTube offices, going to the Twitter offices. Mm -hmm. But for some people, you know, this is unimaginable. I don't know how to go to the YouTube offices. So how, how do you get in that situation in the first place to even be that guy to connect the dots? You know, you always got to start. That's a question that everyone always asks about, like everyone I work with. And how do you even get here? You always got to start with one. And in 2009, I was lucky to meet Floyd Mayweather. And Floyd was always very open-minded with doing everything. Around that time, maybe 2010, we launched Floyd's YouTube channel. And Floyd was one of the first, like, let's just say mainstream celebrities with their own YouTube channel, creating original content, not just ripping off something that was on TV and uploading it onto YouTube, original exclusive content onto YouTube. So I always started with one back in 2000. How, how did you build enough trust though? You just said you, you met Floyd and then you launched a YouTube channel. What was in between that? Because I think that's what people struggle with. They can meet these people, yeah. but then it's building the trust and relationship that they can't do. Yeah. Because Floyd Mayweather is Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. You know, when you're just a guy, it's like, how, how do you? Yeah. So one thing for your listeners to know is I'm 43 years old as well, right? I'm not like a 22 year old kid who just... Yeah. You know, I've been doing this for a very long time. So how did I meet Floyd Mayweather? Let's go back to that then real quick. Um, before all of this, um, before all the YouTube stuff in 2009, 2010, which is when I started working on YouTube, uh, we had a, a ad agency, pretty much an agency that worked with DirecTV, which is a satellite TV company. I think you guys have Sky TV, right? Yeah. 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 So it's Sky TV, it's what Sky TV is out um um, out in the Europe and other countries, DirecTV is here. Right after high school, I was 18 years old, and I would just reach out to DirecTV about ideas. They had the NFL Sunday ticket package and had ideas on like how to like make this big and tell them like you know you need some young people coming and marketing this NFL Sunday ticket. Is you could be anywhere in the country and subscribe for like back then it was 100 bucks. I think now it's a couple hundred dollars, and you could watch any football team anytime. And DirecTV gave me that chance back then. My brother, a few years later, graduated from high school. He came on board. And for like 10 years, we had this agency that just did innovative marketing for DirecTV. During that time, they would give us other things. They had football package, they had baseball package, basketball, NASCAR. And then they got into the pay-per-view fight business and Floyd had a fight and we were assigned to do the marketing for that fight. So this and that, and you know, then different football players that I met, Chad Ochocinco and whatnot, Floyd and I became kind of close and I reached out to everyone I knew and Floyd was the first, Floyd and Mike Tyson were the first two. Mike Tyson was also, we were always doing different stuff with them. They were the first two that in 2009 said, so, so we left DirecTV, 2009. They actually terminated us. They're like, you know, they sold to this big company and, um, Big company said, we don't want third-party agencies. We want to do it all in-house. So we said, all right, well, we're going to go and we're going to create a network of A-list celebrities and get them onto YouTube. Was this like a big deal at the time? Like, fuck, I've just lost my contract. What am I going to do? Or is it just so casual? Like, yeah, we've just lost that, but I'm just no, going to no, go no. and it was probably one of the most. Thing. It was one of the worst moments of my life because it was like 10 years. It's a lot of money. We had a lot of employees. Had a situation in our family where someone was really sick too. So it was just one of the most worst moments of my life that... You know, it's a, that's why I don't really talk about it, even though it's a special moment. I try to stay away from those because it was a really dark moment of like, you just think the world's kind of crumbling and it's all over. And on top of that, you got to remember too, this YouTube stuff in 2009, it's like, no one's making money. No one's, you know, it's like, you know, viral videos like Charlie bit my finger and, you know, these like home videos are what's going viral. Mm -hmm. It's not YouTube then was not what YouTube is now. So you know, if you're someone like me going to Mike Tyson or Floyd Mayweather, you, you look like a crazy guy. You look look like a con artist almost, you know? So, um, so, you know, but that's, uh, we stuck with that and they both gave us that chance. And that's what led me to get my feet in the door with YouTube. Mm -hmm. So going back to what does it take for anybody is you always got to start with that one and get your feet in the door and just know, and this is a lesson I teach everybody that life is long life is not short so a relationship and one person that i met at youtube in 2009 because of floyd became the guy that back fast forward to 2015 and 2016 when the vine creators are leaving vine i'm calling this guy like you know today you know when now we're the biggest podcast network on youtube shots is calling this guy so um 
you know, I think it's one of those things you just got to get your feet in the door with one person. Um, and by the way, Floyd is big, but Floyd was not as big back then as he is now. He was not as he was an undefeated boxer, but he was not as popular as a fighter. Uh, he wasn't like, you know, I don't even he had no social media because there was really no social social media at the time. So, um, you know, he was he was just a fighter at the time. You know? I'm glad we dug into that a bit deeper, because um, when you first said it, you said you were lucky to meet Floyd and all of this happened. But actually, was it luck or was it preparation? You'd put yourself in the you done the years of work all through all the television stuff. And then you knew exactly what you needed to do when you were in that situation, when you met him, and then you can go forward from there. So how much would you put down to luck versus actual strategy? I mean, I guess it was strategic. I mean, listen, if back then, if I were to go back to John Shahidi of 2009, who I think I was just turning 30 years old and going and telling him, you're going to be in this spot and you're, you know, you're going to be doing this, but you're going to be an expert in this field. You're going to create products with this network that you're going to build. You're still going to be friends of Floyd and Floyd's going to be a partner in this, which Floyd owns shots with us. You're still going to work with Mike Tyson and he's going to evolve more and more. He, he might think him and his wife might think this is crazy at the time, but in 14 years, they're still going to work with you. Um, if I were to go back and tell that person that this is going to happen, I would probably believe him. Oh, you would? Yeah. I was going to, I, I was almost ready for you then to say, I wouldn't believe that, you know, I would never believe it. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you better than I know you, but I would have put it in there and said, I would have disagreed with that because clearly from the very start, you have something in you that allows you to see where this space is going in the future, that even the people that own these tech corporations didn't necessarily know, you knew what YouTube was going to be. And same thing with the products. You almost, you know, six years ago, if you said to someone, you know, we're going to have Happy Dad and we're going to have Prime and we're going to have Feastables, it was, it was unheard of. People would laugh at you. It seems to me that you've always had that ability to see in the future. Would you put that one quality as one of the main reasons for your success in this space? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird thing to say because it's very hard to explain because the next question eventually is going to be, well, what's next? Yeah. You know, um, but you know, Happy Dad is not the first product that we created using social media. Uh, 2012, we created the Money Team brand with Floyd. That was a brand that was created out of social media, a brand that was owned by Floyd and us, our, uh, me and my brother, um, was only promoted on social media. I mean, we had a Shopify account 11, 12 years ago. Um, you know, we were pushing new products, uh, new drops using at that time. Now Instagram had just come out. So pretty much just Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You know, we were, we, we, we've been doing this now we've gotten better, you know, money team, full send, and now happy dad. How did you land on happy dad? Presumably there would have been some sort of brainstorming process of look, let's start attaching products to this empire, massive brand that we've built. Was it just uh, something that came to you straight away or were there other options on the table that you were weighing up at the time? And I must say, now it's out, it is fucking brilliant. Like when I, I'm a big fan of Nelka, I watch all the videos. And when I first saw it, I was a bit, mm, I don't really know. And as soon as it came out, I just thought, wow. You know, what's funny is, um, you know, uh, you guys know we did a collab with Snoop Dogg. Mm -hmm. um, and Snoop Dogg, I remember like a year and a half ago, he, was at, he said, hey, we should do a collab with your beer. And I go, Snoop, it's not, it's not a beer. He's like, what is it? I was like, it's, it's a seltzer. It's a hard seltzer. He's like, what the fuck is a yeah. hard seltzer? I'm like, that's like White Claw. He's like, what the fuck is White Claw? You know, it's like, it's a very new category. Um, and I still don't fully know what it is. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's. <laughs> but it tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, a seltzer is pretty much carbonated water with malt alcohol in it. Um, so it's a beer pretty much what the ingredients that make beer and the alcohol that's in beer is inside this drink right here. It's not as heavy as a beer, so you don't feel that as bloated. Mm. The calories are a lot less because it's not as heavy. Um, but you still get that, I mean, it still has 5% alcohol. I mean, it has more alcohol than actually some light beers. So how did you settle on it being a, a hard seltzer? Because 
you know, with the Nelt Boys brand, the natural thing would have maybe been to make it a beer or something like that. Or like vodka. Why, what, yeah, a vodka or... would have been perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. why settle on something like this? That, like we've just established, people in the UK, we don't know what the fuck this is. But of course, we're still buying it. Yeah. But why? Um, a few things. One is the seltzer category here in, in North America is, is growing rapidly. Uh, but if you look at the top two players in the space, their sales are actually dropping while the category is going up and it's they don't really fully understand how to every seltzer brand was promoting and marketing their product to, to females yeah so that's why the category is growing because other people outside of females are entering the category but the branding of the top two and the other ten thousand are all going after the same person no one was necessarily hitting the male audience and that's where happy dad came came in and we said all right well, well let's make a seltzer that in this category that's growing and focus on the males so you know that's why it looks like a beer yeah it's a bigger can it's not the skinny can like all the other seltzers um you know all the marketing online is very male focused uh, or at least was you know we, we released the um, happy mama our raspberry flavor back in uh, on mother's day back in may of this year and now um women are now adapting to the product as well so we're taking some of the market share from uh, away from the our competitors do, do you worry about products like happy mum and the way that you would market them because i am going to assume that nelk's audience is very male based and you know of course i do agree that with it being happy dad there are it can live on and people yeah. are buying it that um that don't know nelk i heard you tell the story about kaya was sat next to someone on a plane and, and they didn't even know who he was, but they loved Happy Dad. But, yeah. but how would you market Happy Mum without the lift of the Nelk Boys initially? Well, two things. One is the brands become so much bigger than Nelk that there's a lot of people, like you said. Where did I say that, by the way? I knew I knew that story. But I don't know. I've, I've watched quite a few. I've watched it on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we research talk, a lot for, I guess. too much, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, it was a good example of how the brand has actually grown past yeah, the Nelk yeah. Boys. So when we launched Grape with Snoop Dogg, we were going after like the inner cities. And right now, if you go to like I don't know, Compton, Inglewood, Long Beach, or you know, the Bronx in New York, and you go to any of these corner stores, you see Happy Dad in there now. Because the partnership with Snoop has introduced us to a whole new demographic, blacks, Latinos. Happy Mom, we never launched it with a strategic partner like a Snoop. We had no female. We looked at it. We looked at a bunch of different females. We had proposals out. And last second, we pulled the proposals and we said, Nelk's audience, most of them, most all either have a mom, a wife or a girlfriend that just became a mom, a sister who's become a mom. So they're going to buy it on, and we released it on Mother's Day. So this is now a gift that this, our existing audience is going to buy for someone. So we actually sold out all in one day. We sold out faster than any flavor launch that we've ever launched. Wow. And, and if you go look at our social media, or if you look, I don't even know if the Nelk Boys socials posted about it. Was uh, it a unique flavor? So it's, surely there's an element of that as well, because like, I can't lie, you know, if it's a, if it's a unique flavor, I'll sink a happy mom. Doesn't yeah. need to be a happy dad for me to like well, it. Ra like raspberry. How, how would people even know it's there without the marketing though? That's crazy. And yeah. I remember you talking about um, Costco as well, when you put some stuff there and it actually arrived a week before and you didn't do any marketing, it all sold out as well. Sold out, yeah. So it, it but, just but shows the power. In a way that is also almost kind of accidental marketing, right? It's like if a, sometimes a, an artist will drop a song with no promotion because the fact they haven't promoted it means the fans go crazy and that in itself is yeah. promotion. What did Costco think about that? Like, did they fuck with the fact that that happened or, or what? Yeah, they're reauthorizing us. And so it was, uh, I think, eight or nine Costco's in Northern California that did it as a test run. And now we're being authorized. Uh, that's why we're creating a 24 packs that a lot of people have seen. Um, we're going to be doing a pretty big launch with Costco next year and, and Walmart as well. Walmart's mm. going to be even bigger. Yeah, Walmart will be huge. At the moment, you're in 16 states? 22. 22 now. Yeah. Why are you taking your time so much to expand? Presumably the plan is eventually to just cover the world. Yeah. Why are you taking these baby steps? Well, we're independent. So we're, when we enter a state, we go and we team up with a distributor who does all the delivery and mer merchandising, but we're doing that manually. Like my brother, I wanted my brother to come in with me today, but he's in Pennsylvania right now meeting with our distributors because we're launching Pennsylvania right now. And he goes to these states, meets the distributors. Some some states we have multiple distributors, um, 
Pennsylvania, I believe we have five. So since we're independent, we go in, we meet the distributors, then we meet the retailers. We meet the, I mean, can't meet all of them, but several of the independents. We join all the independent associations. You know, we go and we hire our own team to once we establish those relationships to kind of take over those relationships and make sure everyone's taken care of. We have almost 90 employees right now, 70 of which are our actual ASMs. We call them area success managers that go into the stores and meet with the buyers, store owners, all the decision makers and making sure, you know, if bananas coming back, let the, all the store owners know bananas coming back, happy moms being released. Death Row, you know, with partnership with Death Row and Snoop Dogg, uh, 24 pack. Now we have the 24 ounce. So we're doing all this manually. This is all us. Right. Most people that you know that launch a product and alcohol, specifically alcohol, but most people who launch products, they don't do this. They go and team up. Like Prime, somebody. for example. Prime teamed up with a big company. Yeah, yeah, big, yeah. Big, big company. Not a massive company. So is, they is that the same for the side men as well? I'm pretty sure their vodka is yeah, partnered with- Yeah, I think with, they uh, do yeah. outsource that. Yeah. yeah. Like partner. when Travis Scott did Cacti, it was actually uh, Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser mm. owned Cacti. They, you know, Travis was Pre kind presumably of- Presumably you had, um, you must have thought about, well, when you're launching this, do we partner with an existing um, brand to make this product? Why did you choose to go your own way? It's almost a harder route to go with obviously more upside. Why yeah. did you make that decision that other brands aren't making? Quality control. Mm -hmm. Be able to de decide on Mr. everything. Mr. Beast is running into that problem now with Beast Burger, isn't he? Because he can't control the quality of these ghost kitchens. Mm -hmm. And I believe they're suing each other. And yeah. I believe and the I sides did. came into the same issue in, in the UK with the sidemen as well. They've had to bring it all in-house and open physical locations because yeah. the ghost kitchens and stuff just aren't working. Yeah, I don't know much about the sidemen, but I do know with Mr. Beast, that was an issue. But they learned from that mistake. And Feastables, they own outright. They right. control. You know, they decided when they did this big deal with 7-Eleven, they decided, you know, Mr. Beast and Reed, his manager, they went to those meetings. When they do the Walmart stuff, they do those meetings. And now guess who has the the best relationship with Walmart? Mr. Beast and Reed, his manager, who's a brilliant guy. And he whatever- coming on the podcast in a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, you guys talking yeah. to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, he's, he's on best. Wednesday. He's a beautiful guy. Yeah, I, I love that guy. When he, um, so now, now what does Reed have? What do, what, what, what do the Shahidi brothers have? is that relationship with Walmart. Yeah. So if Mr. Beast has this idea, he calls Reed one day, hey, we should do, I don't know, Mr. Beast fishing poles. Yeah. Reed makes one phone call and he's in thousands of Walmarts overnight. You know, where, where when you do these deals with third party people, like let's just use Travis Scott as an example, when he did the Anheuser-Busch cacti deal, you know, Anheuser, Bush had all those relationships, right? It's like a standalone deal. Now you've got that access to basically sell whatever uh, you want. I'd like to get an understanding of how receptive are these big brands. So when you're first bringing out Happy Dad, I presume that you know you want to try and get it in the biggest chain of stores that you possibly can. Yeah. So you hit Walmart, let's just say for example, on day one, and it's yo, I'm working with the Net Boys. We're bringing out this product. It's going to be fucking huge. Do they believe you? Do, do they do they understand? Is there pushback? How, how are the big companies feeling about this space at the moment? Well, you got to remember when we launched Happy Dad two and a half years ago, people were, were terrified of creators. There was no there was no proof of concept yet. You know, I mean, us Feastables and Prime pretty much came out around the same time. Yeah, it took all three of us, and that's why I have so much respect for Prime and Feastables. And you know, I I know they have respect for us as we all did this together, where we turned around all these retailers and made them pay attention because someone may have said no to happy dad i don't want a youtuber product here and then somehow some way prime got in the picture and they proved the point with prime they're like oh wait we should pay attention to youtubers let's try this happy dad thing or yeah. vice versa you know, know because they didn't think it would sell well or they were worried about maybe cancellation if something happened with the face of the brand then that would impact the brand itself both both right. yeah, yeah. I, and, and the question is what youtubers you know, I mean, there's a lot of YouTubers. Who do I pay attention to? You know, like, do I pay? You know, I, I know YouTubers who have 20 million subscribers that can't move product as well, you know, that have actually gone the retail route and the products have failed. I think that's the problem with short form content now is that people are blowing up so fast and getting to 20 million followers, but they have no connection with mm -hmm. their audience at all and, and they can't sell a thing. They can't sell Whereas a thing. Whereas Nelk have obviously come up the long way. You know, they've mm -hmm. gone through different reiterations of content and had people stick around for the long term, which is why people are prepared to, yeah. to pay and support. At least here in, in the US and Canada, I could tell just by looking at someone in the streets if they're an Elk fan or not. 
Mm, like, you, I know you just you know. You can yeah. just know, like you just know. That's how connected we are with our audience. That it it's not about data and like let's market to this certain group on Instagram or YouTube. Like we know or we're so connected with our audience that we could tell in person, not by targeting ads on social media. It's global as well. It's mm -hmm. global as well because the UK fuck with now all of, all of my boys really like now. Yeah. That's how I got put onto it was through my friends. So I was going to say, I, I almost imagine in the future that shops are just going to be full wall to wall with creator led products. But having said that, we've obviously spoken about Logan and Nelk and the Sidemen and KSI. I don't see that many people in the space that do command enough attention and enough hype to do what you're doing to that scale. Is there any names that I haven't mentioned there in that space that you think do have that opportunity and will you know capitalize on in, in the future? And, and do you think people are going to rise up as well, like Logan Paul and and all of these uh, Mr. Beast big creators? Because it seems like now it's it's a flash in the pan, like we said about shorts, they get famous really quickly and they don't have that connection. Yeah. So for one, is there someone in the space at the moment that can do it, and will there be those people in the future? like there are now. I don't think you need to be as big of a name as Mr. Beast or Logan Paul or Jake Paul or Nelk Boys. I, th I think smaller people can also do it as well. Just like I think the biggest names, names that are even bigger than these names. Well, I guess they don't get bigger than Mr. Beast on YouTube, but you know, there are bigger names than Nelk. Um, there are bigger names than Logan Paul. Just like they could fail, there's people who are smaller. Let's just use an example. And I'm gonna say his name because you know, he, there's no disrespect by saying he's a small creator because he's not small, but compared to these guys, small, but like Keemstar, for instance. Yeah. I think Keemstar can make a product. Mm. Um, I think he can make a product that could be just as big as Prime or a, a Happy Dad. A physical Dad. product or like a membership sort of thing? No, 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 physical. Like really? we're talking about like yeah. something in a store. What I think would you envision are, for him? It could be anything. It could be anything. But the thing is, why Keemstar? Specifically, Keemstar. Why Keemstar? Why could Keemstar do it? Because it's not just having a product. It's not just having Walmart give you a chance. He'll go and put in that work. You gotta remember, Nelk, Mr. Beast, Logan Paul, put in that work. Another, another, another person that I think could, it was very small creator, actually smaller than Keemstar, but not not small, but just smaller than Keemstar. Bradley Martin. I think Bradley Martin could create a product. Mm. I think he does, right? He, he has, has raw gear right yeah. now. And raw gear is going to be successful because Bradley Martin's going to put in that work. You know, if he, you know, it's going to take a long time because he's competing against a lot of different people, not just the young LA's and all that, you know, eventually the Under Armors and Nikes and all that stuff. But he's not going to give up and he's going to make that work. He's going to, you know, so I think it's the, the drive that the creators have. If I were to call Kyle and say, hey, before Drake concert, I know this is big. I know he's got an album. Probably going to hang out with him. Probably going to crack some happy dads with him. Before I do this, I need you to visit this account real quick that's about to bring on Happy Dad. We're launching Canada next year. That's going to bring on Happy Dad next year, but I need you to do this real quick. He'll do it. He's going to be like, dude, no, I'm not. Uh, enough happy dad stuff. You know, he, that's not. He hasn't got the ego. He's, he's not going to. The ego, the laziness, you know, he's still going to. And I'm sure. Jeff, Logan Paul's manager, if Logan's wherever he is right now, tr probably training for his fight, and he says, hey, I need you to go to this Circle K real quick and do this quick signing for Prime, he'll do that. So my point is, it's the drive, it's the work as well, where some of those creators, going back to that one creator that I said that has over 20 million, this person launched a product, did a couple store visits, mm. got over it, product died, you know? And, and the product was actually a perfect product for this person, but you know, just didn't want to put in the work. And I think it's the work that goes with it. Mm. And that's why it doesn't matter how big the creator is, even if some of the short form people, um, if they put in that work over and over, if you go back and look at the very beginning of Happy Dad and, and what Steve and Kyle did, I mean, I think it's like earlier this year, we'd count, I think it was like over 300 meetups in the first year, um, which each meetup is, you know, couple hundred fans and pictures and handshakings. I mean, you're talking about, you know, they put in the work and they still will. They still will. So, you know, we're two and a half years in, we're in 22 states. We're going to probably do a hundred million can sales this year. And they still will put in that work like it's day one. And that's what it's going to take for a product to be and successful. And that is the most important part. Like I think a lot of people will watch this podcast or they'll watch the Mark Tilbury channel or they'll read a book. And they learn so much stuff and then they think, oh, but 
I'm putting all this time in, I'm not getting anywhere. But what have you actually done though? You know, mm -hmm. where are you putting the work in? And I agree with what you're saying about Keemstar because regardless to what people may or may not think of him as a person, back in the day, you know, this guy's ran through like hundred different YouTube channels. You know, he was getting deleted at a mass scale early on in his career when Drama Alert was blowing up and, you know, dealing with all of that. If someone got to a million subscribers and their channel got deleted, it's like, oh, the algorithm hates me. You know, I, I can't do this anymore. And then they just quit. But yeah. he starts a new channel, million subscribers again. I'm pretty sure he got deleted multiple times, didn't he? On, on hundreds so, of thousands, yeah. if not millions of subscribers. And he keeps going every time. How many people are involved with Happy Dad at that executive level? And what roles, who are they? And what roles do they play? Well, we're hiring at executive levels all the time because it's getting big fast. So, you know, we have myself and my brother. Yep. Um, who we both pretty much split our roles between operations. Um, you know, our our meetings throughout the day go from, you know, I mean, it starts with our breweries. So we have four breweries right now that actually brew the product. And actually, even before the brewery is the creation of the cans and the boxes and the trays, get those over to the brewery, get the product made, product gets made. We have different distributors in every single state. So then we order the trucks. The trucks come pick up from the the four different breweries, depending on what state and which brewery the breweries are throughout the U.S. And then the product goes, leaves the brewery, goes to the distributors. Distributors then deplete the product to the different retailers, whether it's a local liquor store or Walmart or Ralph's, Kroger's, Bevmo, whomever. And now it's in the store. The ASMs we were talking about, they go and meet with the stores, build all the proper displays that I'm sure everyone sees online that we always post about. They go and build those displays. Then there's the marketing of the product, social marketing. And, and who actually owns Happy Dad? And who like, has equity? Kyle, yourself, your brother? Who Who's involved in that level? And with the taste, like who has final say on what goes out? We all work collectively together on, on the final say. You know, everything is all collective my brother and i will come up with like the bigger idea whether it's like a flavor and then we'll run it by the team but on the executive side we do have like the butau family they come in and they make sure like the flavoring is on point that's who, that's what that's what they've done a great job of they handle the relationship with the breweries we have a guy steve powell who's a absolute beautiful man i love the guy he handles all the relationships with like the big chains and you got to also remember, you know, we keep saying Walmart and we keep talking about Walmart and Costco, but there's like chains in like some states that I've never even heard of until we've entered these states. You know, there's chains in like that are, you know, a couple hundred locations just in the state of Ohio that, you know, me, someone that's grown up in California has never even heard of them, but they've got 300 locations in Ohio, uh, 200 locations in Wisconsin, a completely different state uh, chain, North New York. You know, there's a chain that's like 70 locations just in North New York. And then on top of that, those are grocery chains. Then you have convenience store chains. It's not just 7-Eleven and Circle K. You know, there's all these gas stations. You know, we have Chevron that's pretty much dumb. I mean, Chevron's nationwide, but dominant on the West Coast. You have golf in the Northeast, you have, you have love in the, in the Southwest, you know? So, you know, then there's, oh, there's so many chains and that's where Steve Powell comes in. And then we have Joe Sandoval who runs our ASMs, all the sales team. And he runs every salesperson. We have almost 70 of them report to him. It's a lot of work right now. So we're starting to hire like more, like on this case of Joe Sandoval, we're going to start hiring regional people. Mm -hmm. So instead of 70 people reporting to Joe, he'll have someone that's in the Southeast and the West coast and the Northeast Midwest. And they, they'll maybe break down the 70 into like 10 to 15 report to the regional person. And then the regional person of, uh, report to Joe. Um, so there's that. Then there, we've got the marketing side of, team, uh, of the company. We have an events team that go to all the different events from golf events to private parties to the UFC every couple months throw a big party for all their employees. And it's always like pretty much happy dadded out. So we'll go and make sure we'll work with the UFC team to make sure like their corporate events, um, charity. Um, so then we have that side. And then I mean, I'm remember forgetting some oh then we have our merch our merch is a whole different beast mm. itself it's a whole different business so this is the, the caps and the, the shirts and everything everything party party um accessories does that does that do better than the full send merch no full no, no, no yeah full send yeah yeah it, it does very well yeah 
But full sense on a different level. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts and decision makers in this business. I myself work a, a lot with my dad and I know everything's not sunshine and rainbows all the time. We have arguments about certain things. So I'm wondering how do you navigate those situations where you don't all necessarily agree with something and maybe one person feels very strongly about it and another person's against it? I mean, the good thing is we all figure it out. We don't always get along, you know, like we don't always get along. You know, uh, my brother and I don't always get along. Kyle and I always don't get along. Kyle and my brother don't always get along, but we always figure it out. It's a family thing. It's, you know, it's the same thing with me and my mom. You know, sometimes me and my mom, I'm 43 years old. Sometimes I get that call from my mom, like I'm 12 years old, yeah. but we always figure it out. It's, I think when you've got that, you know, going back to that first meeting that we were talking about is like when you got that love for someone, Steve included, it's like you figure it out. You know, you might hang up the phone. I'm sure they've hung up the phones like, wow, John's a fucking <laughs> asshole. I know they've done that. I know. Have that but, with my dad as well. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, you know, and someone will call me and be like, Steve just called you an asshole. I was like, it's all right. He's going to call me tomorrow and tell me how much he loves me, you know, and that's vice versa too. It's like when you got that love for someone, it's like, you know, it's you can't you can't really be separated so, so why and you figure it out why the note boys and i know we spoke about this a little bit earlier and you said that as soon as you met you know you just clicked and you knew that you you needed to go with them but you know you you've been in business with the likes of justin bieber floyd mayweather you've of course got the shots podcast network and, and all of these things going on in your life so why the note boys why go all in and allocate the majority of your time to, to these boys I knew how driven they were. They were not going to give up on a product, you know, um, not to say that people like Floyd or Justin ever give up. Floyd has his own empire and his, you know, his goal and he accomplished his goal was to be the greatest boxer. And I, I, I strongly believe he is. Justin Bieber, want to focus on music. And during this, you know, in the last 10 years, Justin's really evolved his brand in music as well. You know, it's for a musician that had such a young audience, why do nine out of 10 of them disappear and become someone called so called has been is they don't grow with their audience. Justin's always figured out how to grow with his audience, you know, just like Taylor Swift has. Where, and I want to hear more about that, but where's Justin's product? Because if you look at the other people on his level, whether you're talking about The Rock or Kevin Hart or Drake, or Conor McGregor, they've all got something. Why hasn't Justin gone down that route? I think because of what I was just talking about, I think he's been wanting to make sure that his brand and his music has, you know, Justin's 29 now. I think he's gonna be 30 in March. And I think what he's really wanted to do is really just kind of grow with his audience and get to a point where his audience is here to stay, which I think it is now. I think Justin Bieber in his 30s will have his own product. Mm. You know, he's still only 29 years old. You know, Justin's Kyle's age, you know, they're the same age, you know? So, um, so I think in his thirties, you'll probably see a Justin Bieber product. His wife has a product. Yeah. She has her skincare product yeah, and is yeah. crushing it. So, and he's going to learn from that. He learns me and Justin talk all the time about happy dad. He's so fascinated with everything we do. We keep, is him. he into business? He, he is, he is, you know, he's back and forth, you know, um, you know, some, I think he's into just loving and enjoying life right now. That's the, that's where he's at right he now. He strikes me as just like a normal guy. He, you know, he He just wants to live a normal life. Yeah. And if he feels like talking business, he'll call me. Mm. You know, he called me a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he was like, hey, question. I was like, why? He's like, why is Happy Dad not in Canada I yet? guess he has Drew. He does have Drew. So yeah. maybe that is actually yeah. the product. Yeah. Yeah. That's one part. I mean, it's a apparel brand. That's one part. I think you'll see multiple. You know, I mean, we'll see how Drew, maybe Drew becomes something where he can make things outside of apparel with it you know maybe drew could become i don't know i'm just throwing this out there a cereal brand or something you know but yeah he's got drew house so bringing it slightly back to the audience um obviously you spotted this youtube um vine thing early on now it's uh it's you know matured a little bit and we've got the products coming out do you think there's still a space for someone to be that bridge between traditional business and maybe uh, influencers or is that already filled and maybe the next thing is is something else that we don't know about. If I were to give a creator some advice, it would be, you know, the world is changing and, and platforms are changing. The way we consume content is changing. The type of content we want that we enjoy is changing. Mm -hmm. And I think what creators need to always figure out. And, and if you know that this is happening, 
the pressure will will be slightly better because it's a lot of pressure. But what creators got to do is figure out how to adapt to that change and adapt yeah. right away, not figure out if that change is here to stay and when do I do it. It's change is happening. Adapt to it right away. And as long as you know that change is always a thing, like right now with like YouTubers, um, the new thing right now is IRL streaming. Mm. And you're going to have to see, you're going to see a lot more YouTubers, non Twitch streamers, non kick streamers switching to IRL, but you can't lose the identity of what people really want you for, which is your regular content as well. You know, you've had to, you've had to switch from your regular content and have short form in addition to regular content. And now you're going to have to have your regular content, your short form content, and now IRL. And I think that's one of the things with creators, but there's no money in IRL. There's no money in short form content. There's barely any money in regular content. Brands are not loyal. You know, mm. these, I'm not going to say the names of the brands because we probably have business with some of them, but brands are just not loyal. We would take a happy dad deal. So yeah, 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 yeah. if you've got something going, yeah, we, but we, we know that you that. wouldn't censor it. Like, I've heard you say that, um, yeah, if it's if the guest has a vodka brand, then you would put it on top of the happy dad. Always, always. You yeah, grow yeah, together, yeah, you see it's collaboration. Always, always. You know, we have a big partnership with Price Picks. They've been great, great partners. And mm. this week we had Jake Paul on the podcast. And I think the word better was, you know, which is Price Picks competitor was mm. mentioned like a hundred times. I'm like, and everyone's like, hey, freaking out at the office. Like Price Picks can be upset. Abundance, my, my abundance mindset. Like you believe there's enough out there for everyone. So you don't need to do this traditional media thing where they don't let you talk about the other so brands. What happened with Jake Paul and Full Send on the podcast? And I saw on social media that, that something went down. I don't know if that was just sort of. I think the guy, um, one of Jake's buddies showed up. I, I, I Honestly, I saw what you guys saw on social media. Hmm. I've watched it like 20 times. Derek. Okay. He's not yeah. giving us anything. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't have anything. I mean, I oh, yeah. saw that. And I mean, the, the answer I've, is that they're both two marketing geniuses yeah. doing what they do. Right? Yeah. We, we, we know that. Yeah. That's, but, that's what I'm trying to get to yeah. though. Is yeah. it real? Like what was actually <laughs> no. gone I'm on? I'm pretty sure. No, I think it was real. For real? I think really? it was real. So yeah. When's that dropping? What? The pod. I think it's dropping now while we're filming this. Can I ask about your relationship with Jake Paul? Because correct me if I'm wrong. Were you managing him at one point? I was. Yeah. And what happened there? What happened was... So real quick on, on that last part, I do got to give Steiny a shout out because I think when I go on podcasts, I kind of like jab at Steiny a little bit, but Steiny actually like held his ground against that dude. Yeah. And yeah. I also think before we move on that yeah. people, you know, in the comments and stuff that they're, they're very quick to bash on Steiny. I know he, he gets a lot of negativity, mm. but you know, people that they, they really don't understand what he's doing and the role that he brings, you know, it, I it's love so him. vital. He's a genius. And at the end of the day, we, yeah, we, he is a genius. Fr from this podcast, we've established Kyle's not a dickhead. Yeah. He knows no. what he's doing. Yeah. And if Steiny was what people think he is, they wouldn't keep him around. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he knows exactly what he's doing. And I think it works very well. Yeah. And he does also since Bradley Martin sort of left from the pod, I would happily start a petition to bring him back, by the way. But, you know, Kyle doesn't really like to say a lot. You know, he likes to sort of sit in the background and observe. So, so Steiny is carrying it as well. And he doesn't get the recognition he deserves for that yeah. either. Yeah, I think I he is. He's a good guy. I'd yeah. love to have him on this show. Um, but but yeah, he doesn't yeah. get the recognition he deserves, I don't think. Yeah. With Jake, really what happened is Jake's boxing career started taking off when I was working with him. And for me, I'd already gone that route with Floyd for a long time. And I just wasn't ready to get into that business. And I just knew that Jake needed someone really focused on his boxing career. This was, uh, I think the last fight I worked on with him was the Nate Robinson fight. Who was after that? Was Ben, ben Askren, I think? Uh, yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that one, I yeah, yeah, right before that, right after Nate is when... I stopped working with Jake um, and it's because he just needed someone full time. So he had mm. this guy, Nikisa, who came on board and Nikisa was like all 100 percent in on Jake. And that's what Jake needed was someone that was 100 percent in. Boxing is a very dirty business. Yeah. Um, and at the time, like people weren't accepting him in the boxing world. People were rolling their eyes like crazy. And he just needed someone to get people to stop rolling their eyes and and make sure that you know he's protected from the dirty side of boxing and um that guy that guy wasn't me you know i had this was happening at that yeah. time so you know i couldn't give him 100 percent of the attention so um jake and i just had this conversation he agreed i agreed and we're fucking honestly 
best buds still to this day. And it seems like a recurring theme. You don't burn those bridges between all the people. Oh, that I you love Jake. The way. I love Jake Paul. Like no matter what anyone says, I love Jake Paul. I love Logan Paul too. Logan came to my wedding. My, I got married in the middle of nowhere last year and Logan and Nina flew out there. Like, you know, um, have you Jake, ever done any sort of business with Logan? Cause I know obviously he was part of that 1600 vine, um, thing. And I know he's been with Jeff for a long, long time as a manager. But has that conversation ever come up? No business, no. Uh uh. Well, I was I've always worked with Jake, and Jake and Logan always like to keep their business separate, which I would they don't do better if they. I think so. I think so. I've, but it's not even something you can even mention to either one of them these yeah, days. They maybe, seem maybe to it's be different. beefing at the moment. Is is that real, or is this just for when clips? it comes to business? When it comes to family, those guys are mm. cl close, like any but do two you think brothers. Having the separate businesses makes them competitive, and then they want to one up each other, and it's helped them. It's a rare grow. thing. Yeah, I don't know. It's a it's a it's it's mm. odd for me because I'm I'm a, the opposite, right? Me and my brother, we do everything together. Yeah, you I'm know? the same with my dad. Yeah, yeah. I'm the, I so it, it's different, but me and my brother aren't two of the most popular YouTubers in the world either. So it's very different. And that's why I think a lot of us, I don't know, you know, I'm sure you guys feel the same way I do. Sometimes when they do support each other, it's like the most beautiful thing. Yeah. When like Logan flew out to the Nate Diaz fight, like I was like, oh wow, this is beautiful. Like I love that, you know? But then didn't that end up ending in controversy? Because he couldn't Logan bring Prime. Bring prime yeah, in. yeah, yeah. Then that happened. It was happened a beautiful then. thing, but then it Until that happened later. Shit. Yeah, until that happened. It's like, yeah, so it's a, uh, you know, but, but when they do support each other, it's a beautiful thing. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But whatever it is, it's working for them. They're both crushing it. They're mm -hmm. always, those two guys are always going to crush it. We're going to, I'm gonna, next time I'm on this podcast in the next few years, we're going to be probably talking about how much those two guys are crushing it with something else. So they're all, those two guys are always murdering it. Mm -hmm. So do you think in the future, the big entrepreneurs will be creators and that's the only way to be a big entrepreneur? Or is there another way to get into the industry without being a creator yourself? Well, the good thing is uh, the definition of creators changed quite a bit because you got podcasting now. Mm. And, you know, as long as you have a great conversation like you three guys, you three guys do on your guys' podcast, you can now get into the business of being a creator. Mm. And I guess the lines are blurred. It used to be you are a creator, you are a YouTuber, whereas now everyone's a creator if you're not, you kind of don't exist almost. Yeah. That's why I think podcasting is so massive. Yeah. You know, I think it's going podcasting. YouTube is, is your guys' biggest platform, right? Yeah. You know, podcasting has made that barrier, barrier of entry into YouTube so much more easier. It was so hard to become a YouTuber before you had to learn how to vlog or you had to be a musician and make music videos or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe do a short film, you know, 10 years ago, that's the only way for you to be, big on youtube um s short form comedy sketch whatever you know it was f it took a lot of creativity um mm. and now it's like you know four dudes with a couple mics just talking about life or business or i, I completely whatever. agree but i think it's also more difficult than people give it credit for i mean it's, it's a few mics but what we're probably still running like 30 grand here so something like you, that you don't need that though. and that's, then but then also though what nice. something that we found is that like you can start a podcast and it's great it's, it's kind of easy yeah i guess you could say but then like you very quickly extort the uk or, or wherever you come from and then now we're in a position where like if we're not landing like a ksi or or someone like that it's, it's difficult to hit that next level. So then we have to come here and then that's another 30 grand. And then after here, it'll be Miami. That's another 30 grand. And there's a lot that goes into it behind the scenes that maybe people don't see. And they think it is just three guys, you know, sat in their parents' house or something like that. Um, and and it's, it's just easy and they're chatting shit, but it's not quite like that. You guys are different, just like Folsom's different because traveling to guests does get very expensive. Mm. And it's very, it's a lot of work, a lot of energy. Um, it's very different. I meant like the podcast, like a Joe yeah. Rogan, who's just chilling yeah, at a yeah. office in Austin and everyone's flying to him or, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who are just like, have studios. Too saturated though mm. with everyone and their cat and their dog having a podcast these days. It'll be saturated. Um, but I think there's two things. One is what's the number to me measure success against, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you're expecting to have a million views every episode, then you're, yeah, you're going to have a hard time because only certain people are going to do a million. But if a successful podcast is 10 to 50,000 views each, and that's your level of success and you're doing good and people are listening, you got that core audience and, um, you know, and you're catering to those audience, uh, and also you have niche conversations as well. I think it would be okay, but it's, it's a good question because I had a meeting yesterday with a friend of mine who we were talking about creating a bunch of sports podcasts. We were wondering like, you know, it would, 
is there such thing as like 20 NBA podcasts? He asked me that and I didn't know the answer. I was like, I don't know. I don't know mm -hmm. if there could be 20 NBA, you know, there's no NBA, good NBA podcast, which is mind blowing to me. Um, at least on YouTube, I think there's a couple of exclusive ones on Spotify, but not nothing on YouTube right now. And he, he's saying, do we do one or do we go sign 20? I said, oh, I think one. He's like, is there a world where there could be 20? I was like, I don't know, which goes to your point. It's like, mm. does one or two great ones make that mm. that vertical saturated? Yeah, because people have only got a certain amount of time and podcasts are long form. So if you stick one in the car, on in the car, you're not going to be listening to another one because you're already at work or wherever yeah. you're commuting to. Yeah, I think the problem I've had too is I've always compared podcasting to like an Instagram. And I've said this before is I think everyone's going to have a podcast just like everyone has an Instagram. But the difference is it takes like two seconds to look at an Instagram picture or 20 mm -hmm. seconds to watch an Instagram video. Where here you're talking about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, hour, two hours. So I do think everyone's going to have one. Now, what's measured as a successful podcast? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I've thought of creating one myself and I've told myself, I don't know. I don't know if I could get a million views, but I was like, do I want a million views? Or I know for sure, hundred percent, I'll have 10,000 views. First maybe. guess, Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, that, that would screw everything up. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but, but I think, um, but well, yeah, how do you do that 52 times a year, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I guess that leads into another question though, is that when we want to do a trip like this and, and get podcast guests, we, we book the trip and we just throw ourselves in the deep end and then we think, right, who do we really want to talk to? And then, you know, we reach out to some people. I shit you not, every single person I've reached out to, to come on this trip follows you. So you seem like the most connected guy I've probably met and probably that I even know on social media. So that would give you a unique opportunity to start a podcast because you can tap directly into these people. But I guess my question goes further than that. How do you go about building a network like that? Because a lot of people watching this will come from a situation like me, where maybe they grew up on a council estate, their friends aren't interested in business, maybe they're trying to elevate higher than what their friends could imagine them to. And it's like, where do I go from here? And if they're not lucky and maybe they don't find a way out of the environment that's been set on them, where, where do they go and how do you break that mold? Well, one is, I think you're right. If I were to create a podcast, there, there's the network of, you know, I mean, anyone you've seen on the Full Send podcast, I could probably get. But the, the, the thing is, I would also would rather them go on the Full Send podcast. Yeah. You know, so, no, you. you know, even if like Elon, if Elon said, yeah, John, congrats on your podcast. I'm coming on. I personally, I think I'd rather... Elon go on part would you, two. Would you just jump in for that app? Uh, well, the, the reason I jumped in on that one is because I know Elon so well mm -hmm. that I wanted that po conversation to last long, you know? So I just knew if you watch, like every time that conversation was about to end, I would a ask a question that would like Elon would have like a 20 minute answer to. It, it was a big deal though. I mean, like you could tell that, that Kyle and everyone thought it was a big deal. Like they was a little bit nervous at first, you know, they needed to- Well, we weren't sure. I mean, I mean, man, I wish we could have done a whole- fucking netflix documentary <laughs> on that one episode like it was it was the craziest craziest thing like first of all we land in austin and when we landed we had no wi-fi on the plane so when we land in austin i got a couple of texts but one of the text messages was from youtube that steve's channel was permanently deleted mm -hmm. and steve's landing i forgot from where i think he was in like brazil or somewhere and he's landing in austin at the same time um, so it was like, we landed and it was like this bittersweet. We're like in Austin, we're excited to do this podcast. And I get this and it was like, it was like a text, not like the message I got was not necessarily, Hey, it's about to be, if you do this and that, it was like, no ifs, no buts, this is gone. Don't even bother to drop the John Shahidi card on us. It's not coming back. <laughs> it's horrible how they can just turn that switch off and that's your business done. I, I know obviously he's doing other things now, but smaller creators, they would be done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And I mean, his content was extremely positive as well. I mean, I know like he, he's, you know, he does his thing and he's sort of drinking and he's smoking and he's encouraging things and maybe gambling and, and stuff like that. But the amount of lives that his content has changed. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a Steve will do it video where the guy hasn't given away tens of thousands of dollars. 
people don't report that to YouTube though. No, of course right? not. You know, they, yeah. they don't. Is that what the problem you know? was? Was it people reporting certain behaviors or was it someone at YouTube just going, I don't like this guy? Like, did they give you a reason? Did he not fuck up with the gambling thing? I've heard on these can, you know, these channels that make the, YouTube the URL. Thing. Yeah, because you're not allowed to show you, uh, URLs in a YouTube video and he, he was gambling and didn't cut out that URL. That's what I've heard from, from third party. That, that, that's what we, we've been told too. Yeah. But man. not the reality. Other people do it. It seems strange. Yeah, how, like seen. he can't even go on podcasts. You, if he if he does, you you have to blur him out. And we've had Andrew Tate on the podcast. It's got six point nine million views and not yeah. being taken down. <laughs> don't speak yeah. too soon. No, but I mean, I don't think YouTube are watching into this. Don't clip this bit up. Yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. that does seem crazy. Like he's nowhere near as controversial as Andrew. But we can keep that a up. A lot of times, there, there's people more controversial than Andrew and that are still on YouTube, yeah. you know? But so why why Steve then? Or do we just not know? They, why did they have this vendetta against Steve in particular? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If I had a pinpoint to anything, I, I don't buy the gambling thing. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen many other people I don't do gamble. I don't buy it. I've been told that every time Steve talks about it, I roll my eyes. I'm like, that's not it. I, I think it's Trump related. I think it was... Triple but so, but then the question is, well, why not the Nelk boys? I don't know. I personally think, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Andrew calls it the Matrix. Mm -hmm. I think the Matrix just knows how powerful Steve is and how influential Steve is. When you told Steve that his channel had been deleted, what was his reaction? He was crushed. He's still crushed. It's been mm -hmm. 15 months. I mean, think about it. You're tw what, Steve, 24 years old. You're like, you can't be on YouTube and no real reason why. And he loved YouTube. Like you yeah, could just tell, he, he strikes me as like a, you know, an emotional heart driven yeah, guy. Yeah, and and he hard. really did put his all into it. You could see You know, it. it's hard for me to talk about it because you know, there's just so much more at risk, but it sucks. But I'm also confident that one day you, Steve will be back on YouTube. It's nice to see that. I don't know about the main channel, obviously. I, I assume it's still demonetized, but it exists. The, the podcast is almost being embraced by YouTube a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I, well, you know, I think Elon's changed the landscape of mm -hmm. social media. I think as soon as Elon bought Twitter and, you know, m made it a real competitor to everybody. X is a competition to everybody. I what think do you it, think about the name change, though? I love it. You, you do? I love it. So, so do you love is, it so much? Yeah, Twitter what just reminds me of just... Well, X is supposed to symbolize everything. And I think the uh, idea of X is to be the everything app. So I think right. one day, you know, the, the, it'll be like status updates. Uh, it'll be banking. You know, we've seen that. Mm. Uh, I think it'll be long form video of all sorts, podcasting, audio, music, private encrypted messages. I think it's going to be, you know, everything, uh, mm. photos. Uh, it's going to be the everything app. You know, like why, why do you need... I mean, just like in China, you know, where they have WeChat and that's everything, pay, payment processor, you know, WeChat, is, you know, you, you go and you pay with WeChat. They don't have Apple Pay there. Like they have WeChat, you know, the app, your your social app. And that's really the vision of X. So and I don't think you would think of Twitter that way if you kept the name Twitter. I don't think you would trust the Twitter brand. The Twitter brand was not trusted, especially after all the Twitter files mm -hmm. that came out. You just mm -hmm. don't really trust the brand did, Twitter. Did he have this vision when he bought it? Or did he just buy it because he wanted it and then he sort of thought, ah, oh, fuck, what am I going to do? <laughs> um, I'm sure there was a bit more to it than that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think he talked about it. What am I going to do? I think he talked about it early, about it being X. Yeah. Do, do you have any like crazy untold Elon Musk stories besides the Justin Bieber and Jet story? Because that, that story is brilliant. I love but, that story. Um, you know, that was 10 years ago, exactly. That was September of 2013. I don't have crazy Elon stories. I just, um, one thing I got to say about Elon is like, what you see is what you get. Like, he's one of the realest guys out there. He's very smart, obviously. He's not, you know, but he's also normal. He's like a fun guy. Um, he loves life. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of stories. I mean, I really need a short here. So if you could, if you could <laughs> short, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to one, think. I'm trying to happy. think of one. But I mean, you know, I talk to the guy probably two, three, four times a week, and we just talk about. He really cares about creators and creators coming onto X. You know, I think that's really the future. Like what the future of content creation of. X is going to be going back to what we were talking about earlier is creators want to go somewhere where they care, you know, where they're cared about. And, you know, I don't know how much money X is necessarily going to uh, generate for creators. Um, hopefully it's at the YouTube level, AdSense level. Mm. But if it's not, creators should know that 
they're all, and no matter how big you are, whether you're Mr. Beast or a creator with, you know, s several thousand followers, um, Elon's going to care. Like he cares. I, I could call him about any creator at any, it doesn't matter if the name is Bad Bunny or some up and coming artist, he'll, he'll care the same. He's not impressed that someone's so much bigger than someone is else. Is that some advice there that you would maybe give to people watching that if you want to try and make something, adopting X early could be the way to go? Because I think this is something that we're also guilty with across all of the brands that we're involved with. Twitter is something that we've never really adopted. You know, even just the Mark Tilbury brand, for example, we're at 10 million followers now across social media, probably 5,000 on Because, on because we're so video centric though. Yeah. And we don't feel like Twitter's that yet. Like X might become that and then we'll jump onto so it. So is there some early adoption here? Like you got involved in the creator economy very early, which allowed you to, you know, skyrocket to the levels that you've reached. Is, is there something here with X that maybe people could, could see? Video. I would suggest everyone that's making video, especially long form video, to go on X. Um, X's video platform is so much more advanced than it was a year ago um, when it was Twitter, and it's getting only better. I, I've seen, I've seen what they're creating. So, um, so, what are you talking about? Like, so can I get a Mark Tilbury video from YouTube that's got three million views and just download that shit and throw it on X? Like, is that what we're talking about? Well, not shit. Well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could upload what you're putting on YouTube onto X. Uh, the only thing that X X is making their video player better um, over the last few months, there's been updates that have allowed uh, picture in picture, background listening. Um, there's going to be certain timestamps where you'll be able to repost a video on X, and you could timestamp what part of the vid video that you want someone to specifically go to. But I think the big thing that X is going to work is working on that's going to take some time. And once they nail this, it's going to be up there with YouTube is discoverability. Because the problem right now with X is uh, like full send when uh, when Nelk had Trump part two back in, I think it was uh, April, was uploaded. The full ep uh, episode was uploaded onto X. But you have to go and deep search that one. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the discoverability is very difficult. Um, and at the time you had to be following. Mm -hmm. I don't even think they had the for you yet. But even if they had for you, for you is really the last 24 or 72 hours. But you know, something from like, you know, if your interests are watching Trump videos and there was an episode, a great episode from five, six months ago, you know, it's, you have to, you know, it, that that video is buried. And once that's figured and they could get that one video to resurface now, just like YouTube does, you know, I've seen videos two years ago resurfacing now on my we homepage. We have this all the time. Like YouTube is fantastic for that. Yeah. Like that's that's sort of almost. Yeah, especially if you create evergreen content. Yeah. Just, not, not new. Yeah. Our strategy content. has very much been evergreen content. You know, how can we make a piece of content mm -hmm. that will still be relevant in yeah. two years time? And we'll just wake up one morning and it's like, fucking hell, mm -hmm. you know, that video that we made two years ago is getting, you know, 10, 15,000 views an hour, yeah. which is pretty good for, for yeah. an old piece of content. Yeah, that, that was the difference between YouTube and Twitter, let's not say X, with Twitter, the difference was evergreen content for YouTube could go back the last two to three days, or I'm sorry, the last two to three years, mm. where on Twitter was the last 24 hours. Mm. Anything past 24 hours was old news on Twitter. I think once X figures out the balance between, yes, there is relevant news that's today, but there's also relevant content was from two years ago that someone would be interested in today, uh, right now. And once X could figure that out, X is here to stay. How do you feel about the longevity of these alternative platforms like Rumble, for example, that Steve is obviously utilizing? Rumble's also going head to head with YouTube right now. Um, Rumble's also very, very new. And, you know, my thing with Rumble is I think Rumble's, Rumble's kind of working backwards right now, meaning they're working on relationships with content creators versus the product first, which is fine, which is fine. It just doesn't look good but what i know because i know the ceo very well and he's just building relationships with all the best content creators right right now and on the back end working on the um actual product there's a lot of platforms that have been out there that the products come out but no relationship with content creators so it's become a ghost town how do they have this stupid stupid money though like they are just throwing silly money at people and it's like where does yeah. that come from is it even real like are people just just lying well one is they're they're publicly traded so they have some cash but um and they monetize but um but i do think most most of what you've heard is not true you reckon I, yeah i think i think well uh, i think a lot of people kind of like you know they'll get a lot of clicks if they go and say like yeah you know i just got paid 75 million dollars 
Is there like an element as well, though, like where maybe these companies are like, yeah, we'll cut you a, a $50 million deal. Don't know how we're going to pay for it yet, but we'll pay you monthly. And hopefully in six months time, we'll have more money than we do now. So, I don't, so think, anyone, I don't think anyone that has $50 million to cut is that stupid. I think that's that. how FTX operated. Not Yeah, yeah. well, I don't know, <laughs> though. That, that's how yeah, they how, operate. Yeah. We don't know. I don't, I don't think Rumble's operating like that now. I think... I think, you know, even when you look at like some people who got these big Spotify deals, you got to remember Spotify didn't just give them that money. It was an advance towards future ads. So let's just say like I don't know, someone that just sold a, uh, we, we we did a Spotify deal a couple of years ago with Lele Pons and, you know, how Spotify works is like, yeah, we'll give you X amount of money, but let's just say we, they give you a million dollars. The first million dollars in ads is going to go back to us and then we're going to do a rough share past that one million. Every one of these you know, whether it's a record label or these platforms that are now taking the model from a record label is they'll get that do that money first. And they're not going to throw that money out unless they know they're going to there's a roadmap to getting that money. If they know that they have, let's just say Rogan, for example, Spotify, when they gave Rogan that money, they knew brands are going to call and they got every brand relationship because all of a sudden now. Yeah, let's get the biggest podcast. Bring yeah, let's bring them here. And then now let's have advertisers mm -hmm. pay attention to us. Mm -hmm. So now let's create a brand team because advertisers are going to call and us. They might want to sponsor someone else. And let's now have a whole brand team built off of Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. And by the way, let's make that whatever they gave Rogan, 100, 200 million. You know, let's give them that. But at first, I'm pretty, I don't know Rogan's deal, but I'm assuming the first 100 million, 200 million went to Spotify first. Do you think this ends badly for creators, though, in some way? Because I know like the, the record labels in the industry is notoriously bad for people getting fucked over. You know, artists' careers get ruined from signing bad deals that they can't get out of, and it's album after album. You know, is there an element of people that maybe get these deals and they don't understand that this million is only for this and then it's going to be a rev share afterwards? I don't think the the model's going to last much longer. I don't think platforms are going to throw money at creators that much longer because I don't think creators are going to want to do that because the smart creators aren't going to want to do that. They just know and they've heard that story of the record. And no one's ever compared this to the record label model, right? Like, I feel like I'm the only person that's ever publicly talked about it. But it's the same exact model that everybody hates is what this model is. Yeah. So creators are going to say, like, wait a minute, that's that record model deal. I don't need that. I'm better off just creating a channel on this platform and not be exclusive there, but treat it like everyone else. Because I feel like that's the beauty of this this whole industry, you know, is that people can take it into their own hands and do what they want to do, obviously, within reason, unless they get censored. Whereas, you know, like I say, that that music industry is is deemed very toxic and has been the downfall of many young artists careers that could have been, you know, seriously successful. Yeah. You also don't want to be exclusive to one platform, period, as a creator. And I'll, I'll tell you why. The real money as a creator is going to be creating one of these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to create one of these is by have as many eyeballs as possible. So let's just say like like me, for instance, when I'm on social uh, media, I, I personally spend probably 90 percent of my time on X and I probably spend five to eight percent of my time on YouTube. Usually in the mornings when I'm at the gym, I'll just watch a quick podcast. And then like the other two, three percent, everything else. Um, so that's why you didn't reply to our DMs then. We had to catch you for email. Where? On, on Instagram. Oh, yeah. I never look at Instagram ever. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I'll i post if I'm on Instagram, I just post a quick story and I'm out. Um, but that's the point. But if someone does an exclusive podcast on Instagram, they're not going to get my eyeballs. Because... Yeah, you did an exclusive podcast with Lele Pons on Spotify. So mm -hmm. why did you make that decision in that case? For Lele at that time, it was a smart idea because Spotify was going to allow her to still be on YouTube for her non-podcast content. And at the same time, Lele was deep into her music. So it was more of a strategic move where YouTube was supporting Lele's music. YouTube loves Lele. So YouTube was, you know, giving all the proper support. Spotify necessarily wasn't paying attention to Lele as a musician because they never heard of Lele as a musician. So is it building that relationship with Spotify? Yeah. So then, but then when Lele did Spotify, Spotify at that time, um, I don't know what their, um, their corporate structure looks like now, but at that time, the podcast team was completely different than the music team. So now the music, the podcast team is supporting Lele. Lele is on all the billboards for Spotify podcast. Spotify music's like, wait a minute, isn't that the girl that's been, you know, that her team's been reaching about about her music? Well, she's getting 100, 200 million views on YouTube. Our podcast team, it was one of those like, 
oh wow like i i've gotta i've gotta you know jump on the bandwagon here and that's what happened with her music was a spotify music team um jumped on board and then started supporting her music her music started crushing it you know this is a big game right then all mm. of a sudden guess who starts supporting her right after apple music mm. and then guess who starts supporting her right after pandora and then that's how lele's so it's not a career. one rule fits all it's uh, tactical about each creator and what works best for their current situation yeah yeah it was a smart strategic thing you know and it was only a two-year deal first year was covid you know so we're like all right well you know once covid's over with she's gonna be out of this and she can go back and do what she wants Mm. It sounds like starting a podcast is a way to break into the, the new um, wave of entrepreneurs coming in the future. And obviously you run your podcast network. So I was wondering if you could give like the viewers maybe what you look for in a podcast and what they should be developing in their style to become one of those next successful podcasts in the future. Yeah. Anytime someone asks about a podcast, I would say that having guests is probably the least important part of a podcast. Um with the exception of Tate and a couple others, like you guys haven't had the craziest names, but you guys are very successful. Why? Because you guys have a great conversation. And that to me is the number one most important thing is a great conversation. One, that's the, that's the most important thing in a, in, a, in a podcast. Have a great conversation. You could, you could literally someone and their mom could just have a podcast and no guests, no nothing and crush it. As long as they know how to have a great conversation, we would all listen to some, one of our friends and their mom having a podcast. I'd listen to them if they were talking about interesting things that I, I was into. I mean, this podcast first started with me and my dad just talking, it was called yeah. Like Father, Like Son. And then that slowly transitioned wow. into a, a guest podcast. Wow. And, but yeah, we, we find that there's lots of podcasts that get guests on, they get the eyeballs, but they don't retain them because mm -hmm. they just come for the guests and leave because the conversation wasn't well, that good. Well, you know, what you can do is whenever you don't have a guest, you could just have your dad on. Yeah. We well, thought about having him on. You just have him on, you know, Nelk does that. Sometimes there's no guests. Mm -hmm. They just do an internal and it's just mm -hmm. Kyle, Steiny. But Salim. I feel like sometimes they're bigger than, than when they have a guest. I think that's on. what the fans I agree. Want, that's right? why they, they like that. They like, it's yeah. not about the guest uh, at all. So I think that's the number one thing. Number two thing is what we're just talking about distribution. Mm -hmm. Being available everywhere now x as well youtube x with a long form video audio on all platforms specifically spotify apple uh clips everywhere you know youtube algorithm specifically likes two things and two things only extremely long form content or short form content anything less than two minutes that's what it likes there's no in between anymore it doesn't really not at least not today things change all the time but at least not today doesn't really care about five minute ten minute content it's either two minutes or less, which is shorts, or 35, 48, one hour or more, mm. which the only thing really do is podcasts, unless you're making short films. You know, like what else is an hour long on YouTube? Yeah, um, and it also likes consistency, right? So you can't make a short film every, every week. week. Yeah, yeah, you can't, or even once a month, you can't. Um, yeah, so, but the beauty of a podcast is you get both, right? You get that hour video, then you chop up the clips, and now you got the two minute, 90 minute. Yeah. So you got the best of both worlds. Mm. And then, then you've got content for TikTok. You have talk, content for Reels. Mm. Um, you know, Snap's got now their um, short form stuff. You know, so you have all the content for all the other social platforms, Facebook, and then then you know, long form. You have YouTube, and now you have X. That's so, interesting. So I think distribution is the second thing. Then third, if you want guests, get guests. Curtis has got another question for you, but it's tradition on this podcast that whenever we have a drink, I leave to go for a wait. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you guys continue. Do you want us just to continue yeah, right here? Yeah, we'll crack on, on crack yeah. on. What's the value of Happy Dad right now? And where do you think it could be in the future? We don't have a recent evaluation. We're just waiting to get this mm -hmm. year over with. Um, we'll probably announce some things early next year, but this is our by far our biggest year. We've nearly tripled the size of we were last year, which was our first full year. And then next year, we're hoping to continue that growth at least 2x, maybe even 3x so next year. So what does that look like in terms of revenue if we're going to get some clips for the intro? <laughs> if you don't mind talking um, about it. You know, every time I talk about it, that's the only, you know, I don't want to spark any uh, issues with some of my partners. Fair but, enough. you know, but if you look at what we've talked about valuation in the past and, if, you know, and kind of look at that timeline, I've said it's 2 x maybe even close to 3x you know like i think some people could go and do the math there are you building to sell or are you building to have this be around in 30 years time and competing with some of those big brands that we know that we yeah. won't mention i think that's a that's that's a very 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 good question that i love answering and it's i think something for listeners to, to kind of share my experience when i started shots in f 2009 so 14 years ago 
my goal was always to sell shots from day one. And all I wanted to do was sell shots. And all I did was the take app. meetings. Uh, it was started as a YouTube platform, pivoted to an app for a couple of years, back to YouTube platform. Right. So 2009 to 2013, we were a YouTube network. Then we got into the app business, we kind of got over. We were always a YouTube network. Just the app got more attention because it was Justin Bieber launched an app. Justin Bieber saw all the media, yeah. you know, kind of pigeonholed us to be an app, but we were always a YouTube network that happened to have an app. But from 2013 to 2015, we had the Shots app. And then 2016, we cut the app off in 2015 and 20, since then we've become a YouTube network. We were, we've always been a YouTube network, but we always want to sell, always want to sell. I said, someone's going to buy us. NBC is going to buy us. ABC, Google slash YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, you know, somebody, big media company is going to buy us. And that's all I ever did. I took meetings after meetings and it became such a distraction where the company was just bleeding money and wasn't getting my focus because I wasn't necessarily focusing on making money and building the business. I was focused on, on this kind of this perception of the business and hopefully selling it. Mm. So a few years ago, my brother and I, we kind of shifted our attention of like, who cares about selling this company right now? Let's make this a real business. And Shots has been more profitable the last couple of years than it's ever been because our focus has been on the business. And that's a kind of a lesson I've taken with Happy Dad from day one is let's make this a real business. Listen, if someone calls us, we're taking that call. If someone's serious, it's calling to call us. But we're not building this to sell us. We're building this to make a real business. And either we get that call. If we do, we do. Or I'm going to be back here in 14 years and say, happy dad's 14 years old. And, you know, and we're, we're crushing it and blah, blah, blah. You know, but at least the company's not going to bleed money. And we're a profitable company. We're in control of the company. And I think that's kind of the model I'm, we're going after with happy dad, which is the same model as shots. It's just making it a business and a profitable, a real business. And don't have that dream of selling. Yeah. What does it cost to get into a business like that? You know, to start happy dad, I presume that the net boys are extremely successful with their, their other businesses that they've pulled that money in and created the brand. Yeah. Um, did, did you put any money in? You no. know, how did that work forming um, the company? No, I, I put all the money in with my brother at the initial. Oh, so really? the, the deal was, yeah, we'll put up the money and they put in the work and the promotion. So that was kind of kind of the arrangement. No, that makes sense. Spe so. Speaking of these other brands. Not to not to take away from them. Yeah. No, no, I, no. I, think I completely what, understand. I, I don't want to get into how much I put in, but the amount of promo that they put in, I would say far more than what, you but know, that dollar amount that I put it, in. It's also good for you to do that, though, because we've got someone coming on the podcast when we get back to the UK, which is the manager of the Sidemen, who are extremely big in the UK. They're, they're what, the what's, his, what's his name? Uh, oh, Jordan. Yeah, Jordan. Oh, okay, yeah, I don't okay. know. Uh, his surname is very hard yeah. to pronounce, but yeah, Jordan, yeah, yeah. he's almost created like a a private family office for the Sidemen. And, and he heads up a lot of things that they do, their vodka business, the uh, the food business, the Sidemen Sunday channel, which is banging like 10 million views a video. And it was like, we'll come in, we will put in the upfront costs and the work to make yeah. all of this happen. And now all they have to do is turn up and, and put the work in and everything's handled for them. Mm -hmm. But but then that makes sense because it's like, that. that's why they would give you that opportunity. And of course, if you're just saying like, yeah, I can help you, but I'm not prepared to, to put any skin in the game, then it's like, why would I work with you if you, if you don't believe in yeah. us, you know? Yeah, and exactly. we, we feel the same way, even when we're working with a brand, you know, we get a lot of good brands that want to work with us. And it's like, yeah, we'll pay you $250 a customer. So, okay, cool, but what's the flat fee? Mm -hmm. Oh, there is no flat fee. Oh, so you, you don't believe in us. You, you don't believe in the brand that we've created and what we can do for you. So therefore we don't want to work with you. You know, we don't do affiliate only deals. Yeah, and I, I think it too. works the same way yeah, with you, that what way you've too. done. Yeah, but maybe that's what um, people can do. If they're not creators, they can come in from that side and build the infrastructure to help the creators and put in the the money or you know generate the money somehow. Obviously, you wouldn't start out with the money, uh, and then the creator can bring the sweat equity and, and form those partnerships. And that's kind of what I did with my dad. You know, I started out making his videos, you know, filming them, helping him with content, and bringing my expertise to him. So it's, it's kind of the perfect model, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I got to meet your dad sometime. Yeah, you would, some I'm sure. I was just going to say- Sounds like a legend. <laughs> you, you, you were talking about getting that call from these bigger brands. I think it's very obvious two, three years time, you are going to get that call. It is coming. Um, where do you think they see you right now? Are they shitting themselves? Do they see you as a threat? Or are you, you know, there comes a point presumably where you, you are a, a threat and then you become something worth buying. 
Mm -hmm. where, where do you sit and how do they, what's their perception of Happy Dad? I don't know what their perception is because I'm not in the room with them. But mm -hmm. if you look at, um, so there's a lot of different public information on how Happy Dad is growing. And in a lot of states, we're a top three seltzer. I think I heard, and I want to double check this. I just heard the last couple of days and once they were number two seltzer. And, you know, who is four through 10? It's all the big beer brands and bigger beverage companies that have launched seltzers, the Budweiser's, the Coors, the Corona, Coke has Topa Chico. Um, that's a seltzer that's, you know, so, um, or their self, they have a seltzer version of Topa Chico and we've passed all these guys. They've mm -hmm. got to be looking at the charts and yeah. be like, who the fuck is this? They've got to be, I mean, if they're not, then maybe that's why they're losing is because they're not actually paying attention, but you know, whether they do or not, I mean, we're just, we're, you know, it's not what I think about. Is it's there a, a future yeah. of like acquiring brands for Happy Dad? Because I presume that a lot of these, uh, you know, companies or brands like Corona or, or Carling or whatever, I presume that, you know, I see a lot of these videos on YouTube from, from great YouTubers like Coca-Cola bigger than, you know, you know, that, that there's so much more going on mm -hmm. than just a can of Coke that people don't realize. Is, is there a future of that for Happy Dad where like, uh, especially like Pepsi, I was going to yeah. say is, is bigger than Coke, I believe, but the actual drink isn't bigger. Pepsi is yeah. not bigger than Coke, but the actual business mm -hmm. and they own water and all this other stuff. So is there a future of that? You know, do, do, does Happy Dad one day acquire a water company that maybe isn't branded as anything that you guys know, but you're just trying to take up that shelf space in Walmart so that, you know, all of these sales are, are feeding into your business. That's something that I always say is we're not in the seltzer business. We're in the shelf space business. Yeah. And we are looking at other products. Um, you know, pretty soon we're actually launching our first non-alcoholic product, which is a beef jerky. Mm. And we were just looking at what products could we get into our best retailers, which most of Happy Dad sales, 90% plus of Happy Dad sales are either convenience stores or grocery stores. So what's a product we could go in there that's not alcoholic. So we could sell to the people who aren't 21 and over because in the US you have to be 21 drink or someone that's 21 or over it just doesn't drink for whatever reason, you know, religious reasons or personal reasons. Uh, what's a product we could sell to them? That's not a beverage for now. Maybe we'll get into be more beverages next year. Uh, and it was beef jerky. Beef jerky was the number one. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the beef jerky landscape right now, almost everyone that's big is trash. Like it's like they're disgusting. So we said, all right, let's make a premium beef jerky. We got we've been working for quite a bit on it. We've been working on it for over a year and a half. But the idea was really to go and create a premium beef jerky, but at a price pay point that was competitive with everyone else. And then using some of our resources our existing relationships are online because we're happy that we can't sell on Amazon. We can sell happy that merch, but we can't sell the product on Amazon unless you're available through Whole Foods, which we're not yet. So what's something we could sell online as well, which everyone knows, you know, that's our, our you know, with everything we've done with full send merch and happy dad merch, our fans are online shoppers. And what's something we could put into some of the existing stores that we have relationships with. So and I, I presume that the possibilities are endless as well, because I think I've seen a lot is like, um, there's like these wrap snacks. I've seen like Lil Baby and stuff. They mm -hmm. have these these crisps Crush, or, or whatever it is it. that you guys call it. Chips. Um, <laughs> chips, yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. Surely, you know, you can enter any market that takes up shelf space. Shelf space and, and price point too. Because one of the things we were talking about earlier too, uh, you guys were asking like, why didn't we get into like a vodka? You know, we're also very aware of the price points that mm. we're going in as well. It's going to be like $50 a bottle. Surely exactly. if you're going to have a premium mm. vodka. You know. Happy Dad, this year, when we start announcing some of our numbers, you're going to look at some of the spikes in sales. One of the major spikes was when we released the um, the grape uh, flavor. But then in end of June, early July, when we announced when we released our Big Papa, which is our 24 ounce um, can, um, that's when the, the real spike happened. And why is, you know, it's a three dollar ninety nine cent price point now in stores, so it only costs three ninety nine. Some stores four ninety nine, but mo most three ninety nine now costs only three dollars and ninety nine cents to try a Happy Dad. So price price point has been very uh, very uh, something that we're very aware of, and that's why jerky or chips, crisps, um, you know, those, those you know those are also you know something at a low price point, so you could talk volume, so more people talk about do, it. Do you think that's maybe where like Prime have had an advantage over you is the fact that it's sort of sold by the bottle, so it's so cheap for for people to get involved and also the fact that it's very applicable to kids 
But, you know, mm. I, from what I've seen, I haven't really seen a Prime multi-pack. No, they do do multi-packs. Mm -hmm. They um, do? Yeah, for sure. You can get multi-pack in Tesco's. Of the hydration? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah. they also You're do right. individual. Yeah, it's mainly by the individual. Yeah. Then I personally haven't seen a multi-pack, but yeah. it may be Prime is very different us because Prime, you can sell to all ages. Yeah, well, Prime's that's, that's a the thing. Prime. Well, not the energy, but the, the uh -huh. hydration. Yeah. Um, but that that's that's their biggest product. Yeah. I don't think their energy is nearly as big as the regular Prime, at least not yet. It, mm -hmm. it might be uh, eventually with time. But but right now their focus has been the hydration and their, their sports drink. But I mean, Prime, you got to remember, Prime is all ages. So a 12 year old could drink it, which is a huge part of their audience. Yeah, um, They're in every single state. We're only in 21 states mm -hmm. and we're only in state in, in, in the states that we're in. We're only in stores that have liquor licenses. They're in all stores without liquor licenses. And because we're self-distributed, we're actually, for as big as happy that is, there's not a single state that we're in more than 12% of the stores with liquor licenses. That's that's the highest amount of, on average, right, 9% penetration in the states that we're in so right there's now. there's so much to go. So we have that. So we have that. Um, and also we're not in the UK. We're, we all know how big yeah, what's KSI going on with is. That, though? I mean, I mean, well, Seltzer's not a big thing. Well, I mean, we got to get into the rest of the U.S. and yeah, Canada first. But, but Seltzer's not a big thing. I agree. Like I say, I'm mm. drinking it right now. I still don't know what it is. Yeah. But <laughs> Nelk is told a you big what thing. Is. But, I know. Yeah, but I still we'll, don't we'll really be there, know. We'll be there, but you got to remember, we're, we're not even like, we're not even in, in North Carolina here. We're not in, in even in Indiana. We're not in Washington State. We're not in Utah. We just launched Pennsylvania, you know, uh, which is one of our, you know, a, a huge state in the U.S., uh, a top 10 state by population. And, um, you know, we're not even in Canada where Nelk's actually from, you know, so. Well, I'll give you an idea. Yeah. When I landed in LA, one of the first messages I received when I got Wi-Fi and my phone came back on was in my group chat that I've got with a few of my boys and two of them said, can you bring some happy dad back? So nice. it just goes to nice. show the cool. UK is asking. Well, looks like we're going Set through that the... 12 pack. You guys might have to get another one. <laughs> I'm just speaking of the box. I'm looking at the box here and I'm seeing what I believe is a bored ape. And it's reminded me of another product that you you did launch, which is MetaCard, which mm -hmm. was the, the NFT product, mm. project. And I haven't heard much about it since. Does that still exist? What is it? And what's the situation with, with MetaCard? Yeah, so MetaCard, we launched um, January of last year. And initially when we launched it, it was really for us to be closer with our with uh, the fans that carry to be, identify who holders are, and which was a lot of our, and still are most of our diehard fans. So. Last year, uh, we did maybe a couple dozen events, one massive one, and then a lot of different meetups from like dinners, private dinners. And it became what, what happened with MetaCard in the first year or so became like a, I hate to call it this, but it was like a super fan club. And mm -hmm. I didn't see the longevity with that. So the first year we, you know, we did, you know, a couple dozen dinners, meetups, UFC events, games, football games, a big concert where Snoop performed all this stuff, but um, I just didn't really see the longevity and I didn't see, you know, if someone wanted to become a super fan that we could have just created nilkfan.com and, you know, charge, you know, something. And But just learning from the music industry, the fan clubs is not a real long term business, especially for the Nelk audience. So what we're doing now is we're going to, because, so the board jerky, so the beef jerky is called board jerky and it's going to be four flavors with our board apes. And what we're doing is some of the holders, it's been a very complicated process, but some of our holders are gonna be actually uh, shareholders in the jerky. So we're carving out a percentage of um, of the board jerky entity and certain holders who've been with us, who have a certain amount of cards are gonna be a partners in that. It sounds like you navigated the NFT space pretty well, because at that time when you launched that product, everyone was releasing an NFT, almost rushing to do so. Like it was the, it was the latest craze. Some projects obviously haven't worked out for certain creators. Um, Logan Paul's, for example, is under criticism for what's crypto zoo, crypto zoo. Mm. Yeah. That was what, heavily went, what went wrong there. And what's your opinion on that whole controversy? Uh, I didn't really, I mean, I, I see a lot of stuff online about it and I know CoffeeZilla made a video. Yeah. Um, I never really looked into what happened and I've never asked Logan his side, so I don't really know much. Um, but when it comes to NFT projects, there's only really been two that I've really paid attention to. One is being MetaCard, and then MetaCard has a second one that was 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 a free mint, the full send Alien Friends, and then um, so really those two, and then and then Board Apes I paid attention to a little bit because we held some in 
you know, um, obviously we had this, the branding around this. I know the founders, great mm. guys. They're actually on the Full Send podcast last year. V Friends? Yeah. V Friends a little bit. I don't know, too, you know. How, how are you with Gary V? I, I've just, I'm assuming that you're, you're kind of boys because you're in that space, but is that- I've known, I've known Gary for a long time since yeah. I was a kid. Um, yeah, great. Gary's a great guy uh, and we, we did a podcast with him. Uh, that's one of the ones I jumped on to. Um, but when it comes to NFTs, I haven't, NFTs are so new and any time, this, this is the problem. This is what happened, quite honestly, even with Metacard that first year, making it more of a glorious fan club is, you know, I was paying way too much attention at what other people were doing. And instead of doing something quite different, um, and that first year we made that mistake of just like, well, they're doing this. They're doing a concert. Let's do a concert. They're doing fan meetups. Let's do a fan meetups. They're doing, they did a free mint. Let's do a free mint. And um, didn't really work well for most of mm. NFT projects, uh, whether you want to call them scams or whatever, just failed businesses. And I know that this one, to me, I did not want it to fail. And then I said, all right, if we just re restart and we kind of revisited this the way we look at anything else, right? Like why a uh, hard seltzer focused on men? Like why not just make a vodka or a tequila or a beer, you know, and just, you know, but anytime we've done something different our way, it's worked out. So um, about a year ago, earlier this year, we decided to kind of do a reset, start focused on this board jerky project. And when that launches, I think we're going to do something very, very different. People are still going to compare us to other NFTs though. Well, hey, you should, and I get it all the time. Look at this NFT, what they're doing. You should, you know, uh, there was one thing I never really fully understood about like staking and like this one, um, it's called Moonbirds or something. They're staking their, you know, they NFTs. They have such silly names, don't they? Has yeah. that kind of died down now though? The NFTs aren't really that big a thing. They're I think that the about. NFTs that are just copying other NFTs mm -hmm. that ended up flopping are all dying. Um, I think if someone could figure out how to do something very unique and different with NFTs and not, there is no blueprint. This thing is so new. There is no blueprint. Um, do you need an NFT to do the stuff? Like you mentioned, you could make the .com site and have the fan club without the NFT. What do I, they actually offer? That to me is the issue with it though. Like to answer his question and then pass it on to you. Like an NFT doesn't need to be an NFT. You know, like, like you said, you could have just had nelkfan.com or whatever. And I feel like the, the real use case for an NFT goes so much further than what people are now saying it is. And, and for example, you know, think how much money kids have wasted on Fortnite buying these $20 skins or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And if I could get one that came out in March of 2021 and was only available in March 2021 for $20 and you now want it now because you think it looks sick and I can sell it to you for a profit or the, or the same price that I bought it for or whatever. That's where I see the, the real use case of an NFT going and, and maybe other things of a similar nature to what I've just mentioned whereas the whole you know board apes or or what you've done it's like it doesn't need to be an nft so therefore the the fact that it is an nft is is sort of just a hype thing to me and nfts it, are to me are just pointers it just helps us identify who is actually like when it's time for us to roll out you know um the equity part of board jerky i know who's been with us since january 2022 you know which is when we uh, first minted. So it's just really a pointer other than that. Um, but yeah, you know, I think a lot of the examples that have happened, they all come, they all have come and gone. Um, I do think though, NFTs are here to stay. I think the, the garbage is all washing away. It's like the internet, man. I mean, you guys are very young, but I remember when the internet came out, everyone was terrified of the internet. I was, mm. everyone was scared to click links. Everyone was like, you know, thought they were going to be scammed if they went on a website and they're, identity and credit card info and all this stuff would be taken and like there was 80 percent of the things that were sent were porn and all this other stuff you know the internet was not a clean place like it is now but you know you still see companies like amazon and blizzards activision electronic arts all these companies really really still invest in web3 mm -hmm. um because i do think the the garbage is going to wash away the scammy is going to go away uh, hopefully it'll be people like us who actually have proof of concepts and then, you know, then I think that's when the big boys, like the Amazons of the world are going to come in. Yeah, Do you I, think I, it will be the next internet though? Because at the moment I'm just looking at AI thinking that's probably the next thing, no. not the, the crypto space. I think, I, I don't think it's the next internet. I think it's a piece of the internet, but I don't think it's the next internet now. What are your thoughts on all of this, this AI revolution? Because we uh, re recently went to Vid Summit. And it was like dominated by AI, like you can do this, you can do that. 
and people are just creating videos fully with AI. So how do you think that's going to affect the creator space? Well, it depends on which creator. Um, like once one space I think that's going to be safe is going to be the world of sports, because I don't think you can AI sports, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so I think and that's why I think you see like people like Dana White and Endeavor and these people making such big investments mm -hmm. in you know, the UFC and WWE and other power slap and all these other uh, Nitro Cross and street league skateboarding, all the, all this I mean, stuff. It's the only stuff that really works live anymore. Yeah. Like you, you need to watch a game live, whereas most other stuff you can just stream. It well, I matter. guess, and it's I know it's not the exact same thing, but if we're talking about VR, presumably there will be a situation where I am sat front row watching whoever fight in the UFC with my headset on and there's a new avenue there for these companies to sell virtual endless tickets. amounts of yeah. front row tickets. Yeah. I find that so sad. Like well, I know it's such a big opportunity, but the fact that someone can put a headset on and think that they've been to the UFC front row when you haven't. But, yeah, maybe but what that, if it sold out anyway and they couldn't sit yeah, there? Yeah, or, or that person wouldn't have had the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, so, or what if they're in the middle of India? No, I, I just, I find this like metaverse and VR thing very, very sad. And I think it could get out of hand. I think AI, chat, GPT, you know, all of this stuff, there's lots of use case for, for it. And I think it's very interesting. But this whole metaverse and, and VR thing, I think is very dangerous. I'm surprised and, you think that way scary. though, because you spend hours playing video games and that's a less immersive but, version. Okay, but then, let, but the then let's look at it. Obviously, growing up, you know, I had a very unfortunate childhood things really really didn't go my way so was me playing video games an escape and yeah, then if yeah, i and never do other kids need an escape if well. i never escaped my escape would i have become who i am today so therefore video games was a good thing for you yes it was but what if that went too far and then i because there was a there was a pivot point when i was 18 or, or something like that maybe a little bit before and it's like I've got no network, you know, no, no real friends. Everybody I know is online. What am I doing? You know, how, how am I going to get- You were developing your leadership skills, running these Call For of sure. Duty games. So, I mean, VR doesn't just have to be games. It can be anything. But it can be my, real life interaction. My, but my concern is that it will just go too far. And I completely agree. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. a big part of my life. And if I never had that, I'd probably be in shit right now. Yeah, for sure. But like- where does it end? You know, well, when well, you put this headset on and your life's amazing and when you take the headset off on your life's shit, why would you take the headset off? So there's two ways to look at it, in my opinion. Um, there's a positive way to look at it and there's a, there's a negative. The positive is that person, that front row UFC, never really got that experience and may not get that experience. That person might find joy in that mm. and might be better to do that than some of the other alternatives as, I don't know, joining a street gang or getting yeah, into drugs, sure. you know, maybe that's their new hobby. Maybe they say, you know what? Maybe they're in the middle of India. They're like, this is fucking awesome. I'm going to save my money. I'm going to work my ass. I'll save my money. I'm going to fly to Vegas and actually go to a real UFC fight one day. That's what, that's the positive way to look at it. The negative way to look at it where you say sad is I agree. Like there might be some people that just get addicted to it, stay home all day, never create proper social skills. You know, we, we, we all see, I think even Elon talked about on our podcast is like, you know, population decline because they don't go and go out on dates and meet. But are these people doing that anyway? Like most people are addicted to the internet video games. Well, but they're getting, but they're getting, it? but they're getting sucked in even more though. And they're not, I think the population decline is really because of social media. I think people are so connected to their phones. They're getting that, you know, that fix that they want, that that human connection on social media or porn or whatever fans, it is, yeah. you know, all that OnlyFans, all that, where they're not really going out and going on dates and, you know, reproducing, you know, the, the only way you can reproduce, you know? So, you know, um, getting married, falling in love because they're falling in love with their phones. And I think that's the, what you're talking about is the sad part of it. And now VR could take that to a whole different level. Whole like, level. I don't want to fucking go out. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go to uh, China and explore the Great Wall of China because I just walked it in my living room on VR, you know, and I'm not going to go explore. So that's the bad thing, way about it. So there's a positive way to look at it. It's like, wow, China looks beautiful. I actually want to see this in person. I'm going to go there myself, you know, or there's a bad way to look at it. So there's there's two ways and it just depends on humanity but, and how we think about it. And the sad thing is I think more people are going to get trapped. And that's exactly what I was just about to say is the way that you look at it there, like it's like almost like an uh, abundance mindset kind of thing. Like, oh, I've just experienced this cool thing in VR. I'm going to now find a way to go and make the money or do the things that I need to do in my real life to level up my real character and get to that place that I want to go. But I think that 
unfortunately, most people don't view life through that lens. And, and that's why that they're in the position that they they're in, yeah. which will then make them them get trapped. And, you know, I was guilty of this, too. I would say that when I was 16 years old, I was a recluse. Like I would literally go to, to school and I would just sit on my phone. I'd be on Twitter all day, you know, got kicked out of school, didn't give a fuck, loved it went to a, a bad school, whatever, then went to college, same thing again, recluse, sat on my phone all day, kicked out of school, great, yes, now I can sit at home all day and just, you know, do whatever I want to do. And I loved it. But yeah. is that good? Not really. Like, yes, it all worked out for me. Mm -hmm. Cool. But that is an exception and not the rule. But but if you had the technology that people are going to have in those situations, imagine if you as a kid mm. could sit front row mm. uh, to a keynote that's 20 grand a ticket that you would have never been able to sit at yeah. and, and take in that information or have contact with people that you wouldn't have otherwise had contact but with. But it's not real. Yeah, but if it becomes so good that it's indistinguishable is from reality, then what makes it different? Only, yeah, you can't reproduce or maybe they come up with something. In yeah, the future. It, I don't it, know. But then, but then again, <laughs> but then, but then you have to actually deep it though, yeah. What if it gets so good that you're there and you don't know that you're not there? Yeah, cool. But that's sad. It is. That's sad. not. That's not cool. Well, it depends if you think we're in a simulation now, and this yeah, is. Yeah, but I'm not David Icke. You know, anyway. I, I, I we don't had believe David Icke on the pod recently, and he talked about the fact that we can only see a certain amount of um, spectrum of the visible light, and you know, this is a human simulation experience. So, what difference does it make if we stick a headset on? And we're in a different simulation. But I, I agree that, yes, there are definitely positives that can come from it. And I think that, you know, there are people that will be in unfortunate um, positions in life and they can use it to escape and stuff like that, which is great. You know, I'm all for that coming from that background myself. But like it has to end. You have to man up and you have to enter the real world to make something of yourself. Otherwise, you will just become a recluse and you will just be sat in this virtual world. And if the virtual world gets so good that it's just as good as the real world, cool you know yeah i guess mm -hmm. there is no argument to that other than the fact that just that is sad fair yeah. enough <laughs> well it all i mean you know with some people it might be a little bit too late but with the newer generation with the younger kids it's all about the parents right now too mm -hmm. you know because parents are so caught up with their phones right now mm -hmm. that it's easier for them to just give a vr goggles to their kid mm -hmm. and tell their kid to shut up or give an ipad to their kid yeah. you know so it all really i i have friends who are parents right now and these people they work their asses off to just take their kids into traveling sports mm -hmm. so they don't become that. And, you know, and they're sacrificing their lives. Like, you know, I'm reaching out to some of my friends like, hey, let's go do this this weekend. It's like, sorry, we have to travel to Northern California, take our kids to this baseball or basketball camp because they don't because the alternative is, yeah, I'll go out with you. I'll just give my kid the iPad and have, get a babysitter. And, you know, my kid becomes that. So it all really becomes on parenting parent, you know, the parenting job is going to be a lot difficult, which scares some people now, which goes back to the reproducing. It's like, ah, oh, shit, I don't want to be a parent and give up my life. You know, so it's all really just humanity. It's like how we think and we'll have to, as we have kids, um, we'll all have to make sacrifices um, and, mm -hmm. you know, just make sure that our kids find the balance between VR or AI or, you know, just regular internet. Speaking of yeah. relationships, you, you mentioned marriage there. You're married yourself. Congratulations. Thank you. I watched the, uh, the wedding video. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, you're obviously a very busy guy who's traveling the world constantly. How do you manage to distribute your time between business and relationships? You guys have a very hard time getting a hold of me on the weekends and after work hours, you know, after work hours and on the weekends, that's her time. So you um, do have work-life balance. Was that always the case or in the beginning, did you have to go all in? Because I know Millie's listening to this thinking, why am I not taking yeah, off the weekends? I, I was <laughs> just about to say, maybe this is where it gets to, because before you answer the question, this is like mine and Curtis's pet peeve, like because we're so young and, you know, we're always on it and we're always on our phones. If something happens, we're on it straight away. So if we email someone and it's like, Oh, I'm on paid leave at the moment. You know, something about a brand so deal who does or something that? like that. It's like, <laughs> I'm on paid leave. Please email this person. And then you email that person. They've got no fucking idea what's going on because yeah. only this. It's like, why can't you just reply to the fucking email? You know, like yeah. this is our pet peeve. But then now we're seeing it from you that maybe this is like the level that it gets yeah. to though, where when you reach that, that certain age and that level that you have to take a step back and, and you know, do more in the work day and then step back on the weekend. But, you know, of yeah. course, I don't want to answer for you. Yeah, uh, well, I have the same pay, pet peeve. I mm. hate those out-of-office reply emails. So I don't set those. Mm. I'll never set those. In fact, 
my brother set one once and I was like, bro, take that, take that <laughs> this shit off. This is not us. Yeah, this is, take that shit off, you, you know? So, um, and yeah, I mean, listen, if it's, if there's an, I, I'll be on my phones, on my phone. So if there is an emergency, I'll respond to it. But if it's not an emergency, you know, um, before my OCD would say like, no, I got to reply to everything. I got to have inbox zero all weekend and this and that, and I got to do it. I got to do it. But now I'm like, mm, everything will survive. Everything will make it. Now, the other be uh, beautiful thing is, you know, Happy Dad's got near 90 employees. I think Shots is at 20 something employees. I mean, we're 110 people um, that are helping build that business. So it's not like before where it was just me and my brother for the longest time where like we had to do everything or the world was ending. But now it's like someone's handling something, you know, we our team, we've done such an incredible job and I got to give hats off to my brother and, and our staff on the staffing and the team that we've built because if, if something's happening, it's not 100% on me. You know, it's someone within the company could handle it if it's necessary, if it can't wait till Monday morning. Um, so I think that's kind of a structure that we've built. Um, you know, in the very beginning, when you are a startup, you do got to put in those hours because you don't have, you know, that village. But now that we've got that village, I've been able to, you know, find that balance after after hours um, on the weekends. You know, they're very important. And it's not just necessarily for her. It's for me as well. I needed that break as well. You know, I've been doing this for 14 years. I've worked with I mean, we've talked about the people. I mean, think about the people we've named that I've worked with. Floyd Mayweather, Mike Tyson, mm -hmm. Justin Bieber, Jake Paul, Lele Pons, Nelk Boys. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, you know, it's a lot of psychology there. It's a lot of brain energy. You know, it's a lot of time, a lot of hours, a lot of different personalities. Everyone's completely different, everyone I've named. So, you know, I think even for myself, I've needed to find that balance as well. Speaking of brain energy, I've got a quote that I want to read you. This is something that you've said. And it's, when it comes to business, I don't make sudden decisions. I sit back and think. Now, me and Curtis work uh, together on a few different businesses behind the scenes. And we're very different in that I like to sit and think if there's an idea that's been generated um, or brainstormed, I like to sit and think on it for quite a while. He likes to, before you've even finished the conversation, the decision's been made and the thing's been done. Mm. How do you find that balance between working fast and getting shit done, but also not making sudden decisions that ultimately you have you can't reverse later on or that become expensive to reverse well just to preface that the decisions i make usually are reversible but i like to take action and yeah. just get going with the thing and develop it as i go versus think about it for ages and then not take and, any and action just, just quickly before you answer that i would further echo that with like right now this place is all right but we're not in the nicest neighborhood and that's because we want to come here <laughs> we, we we look it up and it's like, oh yeah west hollywood yeah that would probably be good for people to come all right, cool, boom, book it straight away. No thinking about it Whereas or anything I'm, like hang that. On, let's let's take a step back. Oh, hang on, let's it's worked in your it. favor. Coming on the podcast, boom, made the decision. You came on the podcast. Yeah. So these things do work sometimes, and it is yeah. a reversible decision. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just I'm just wondering how you navigate getting that balance. Mm. So first things first, LA's gone downhill the last few years. This area, I used to live here. I used to walk this area before. This the area used to be, walking. yeah, this area was beautiful. LA's just gone to mm. shit the last couple of years. So this area was really nice. And most of LA is going to be like this, by the way, right now, you know, so there's no safe. So, so, so when you were coming down here, you didn't think, oh, fucking hell, what have they done? You was just like, oh yeah. No, no, I was like, no, when I looked at my I was like, oh, I know where that is. Oh, that's good awesome. Know. That's my whole backyard. That's yeah, good to know. Because yeah. a couple of people in the shops and that have made me feel a bit uneasy. They're like, where are you staying? I'm like, West Hollywood. They're like, oh, no. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we just hear Hollywood as British guys and we're like, oh, that is the place to be. You know, yeah. that's got to be the best place in America. It always was till about two three years ago this area was so beautiful we used to walk this all the time all this area um all the time um when the 1600 vine is just right down here mm. we used to walk this all the time all day my morning walks would be here meetings me and rudy mancuso used to just have walks our meetings were walks like through these neighborhoods back in the day but it's really been the last three years this area's gone to shit you know the the answer to the question is execution is important you know mm. there's nothing worse than just lingering on an idea and just talking about it, talking about it and nothing happened. Mm. But then also, yeah, I mean, proper execution is also important. Um, you know, I, I think one thing we've never been afraid of is putting a bullet into certain things while they've been in process. You know, I think, you know, there's been certain ideas where we're just like, 
fuck, that was such sounded like such a good idea. It's not fuck it. You know, well, you've spent a lot of money on it, a lot of time. Yeah, but it's not going to work. Whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, life goes on. Um, thinking through it a little bit and not just thinking through it, not just sitting back and wondering, is this good or the, you know, whatever. It's, you know, running the idea by some people, mm-hmm. people you trust, you three have, a, you know, it seems like a very good trust and understanding of um, of business, you know, so bouncing ideas off one another, not being afraid to be challenged you know there's ideas i have that i'll run by kyle i'll run by my brother sam i'll run by steve and you know sometimes like great idea fucking genius sometimes like that sounds corny or yeah that's great but do this and i think you know getting those answers or kyle kyle's favorite things are good idea let me think you know and i'll let him think and let him come back to me two days one week a couple weeks later so it just really take you know thinking through things the world is not ending. If it's a great idea, it's going to work eventually. You know, Happy Dad timing was great, but if Happy Dad launched today, I think it would be just as successful as it was, you know, two years ago when we launched. So, do, do you think that's where like having a good business partner like your brother comes to help? Because I would say that with Curtis, you know, he's very good at executing and making decisions happen. But like you say, bouncing ideas off each other is very important. And I think that's something that Curtis is very good at, where, you know, he will run ideas by us and take our opinions into account. And you account. tell me, however harsh it is, you <laughs> yeah. just tell me the truth, and, which I like and, and I want. And, and then maybe, you know, sometimes he might say, yeah, I, I hear what both of you are saying, but I disagree with both of you and I'm going to do it anyway. You know, may, maybe that yeah. will be the case because at the end of the like day- Like YouTube he, Shorts. Yeah, he is yeah. the decision maker. You know, even when, yeah, YouTube Shorts first came <laughs> out, you know, and it very first came out, he wanted to like, do it. He wanted to do it. Yeah. And I was like, I'm concerned about, you know, growing a shorts audience that isn't interested in the long form and, you know, X, Y, Z and the implications that that could, could bring. So I was just like, it was more so scared. I was like, I'm just scared to start uploading shorts on this channel that, you know, we built, you know, I, I came in at 400,000 subscribers. We're now at, you know, a couple of This is thousand. on the, um, the Mark Tilbury channel, but then we, we only made a million subscribers by Christmas because we started uploading shorts. Yeah. And they were going crazy, like 12 million views on some of them. And they were just simple two person sketches, we call them, where my dad was talking to himself. Um, but yeah, if we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have got the success. So it does yeah. work sometimes, but yeah, I like how you guys balance me out. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was scared. It, it was a scared thing. I was just worried about what the implications of that could be. Um, but Tom wasn't even involved with us at this point. And he was like, yep, yeah, hear what you're saying, but I'm going to do it anyway. And, you know, it, it worked out. So so that was an example of executing even when people disagree. But then there are probably many bad decisions that I've also stopped Curtis from making. So just, you know, having yeah. that business partner is very, very helpful. So how do you find that with your brother? Uh, it's the same way. It's the same way. You know, I mean, there's some things that you just don't know. Like no one really knew about shorts at first. Mm-hmm. Um, no one. One is people weren't really fully sure if YouTube would be able to compete with TikTok because they had launched stories before and that didn't really do that well. Yeah. Um, so there was that part. But then also, you know, the problem with shorts, if you remember, was like, you know, those shorts were blended in with your long form so it was like long video long video then that stupid vertical yeah, video, long form, so I, right I like it that. took them a while to separate that so then you know i remember my brother and kyle were like dude let's just do it i was like do you really want the nilk channel to be nilk video nilk video you know five million seven million views and this random one even if it's got 15 million views this random ugly thing so i proposed and i thought it was a genius idea at the time let's create a second channel just for shorts so we launch a second channel just for shorts. It's crushing it. And what do you know? Right right when that happens, YouTube separates everything on shorts, you know, from the long form content is short. So there's that new section. I'm like, fuck. Like now that, you know what I mean? So like they were right at first about shorts, but they were wrong about blending it. I was right at first about having a second channel. Then they ended up being right. You know what I mean? It's, it was just such a thing it, where like- that channel become Nelk 2 now where they're posting like the gym videos yeah. and, and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, 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 I really yeah like exactly. That. I like the way that they're holding themselves accountable yeah um, and you know posting the transformations and stuff yeah to yeah going. yeah that's a great channel. i know they let to party a lot yeah so it must be difficult. yeah but that was supposed to be vertical ver- videos only now it's mm. become you know more daily vlogs couple minute videos quick you know uh quick videos sometimes a cl- uh, a snippet of the next main milk video but um but yeah so you know shorts is different but yeah i mean there's a, there's man i can't even think but there's so many ideas that we've had that's like you know, there's ideas that I've had that I feel like we should do. And, you know, it's just 
you know, it's, you know, you're also limited with bandwidth, you know, like I really think we should have an MMA podcast, a mm. podcast where we just, I mean, we've got access, you know, we've got mm. some of the best partners that are, you know, have partners in Happy Dad that are MMA fighters, Shaka Sean O'Malley, Justin Gaethje, we just announced. So, so would you do that with the Nelt Boys or would you outsource it and then sort of sign that podcast? Uh, what do you mean outsource? So like, would you have kyle and steiny on this mma podcast or would you give it to the mma guys and then just own it and give no them no yeah we would, we would have someone else do it i don't yeah, think yeah. So you'd find the talent and then own the show yeah it'd be called maybe full send mma podcast or happy dad mma podcast or something within yeah, our yeah. our universe you know i, I want to do that and you know it's also bandwidth it's like we've been talking about it for a while and and everyone's on board for you know about it so it's just you know bandwidth but you know then there's ideas i'm trying to think of some ideas that i've had that have just been shot and you know it's pissed me off at first i'm like all right you guys you know you guys don't understand me and i go into my own hole you know rabbit hole of like you know dark hole of like why aren't these guys listening to then i think about it later like dude that was such a stupid idea like what was i thinking i did i, I want to launch a tequila like happy dad tequila not called it happy dad like you know whatever the translation was in spanish you know, but everyone's like, no, like my brother's like, we're not doing another alcohol anytime soon. We got to focus on a happy dad. I was like, oh man, like, but he's right. He ended up being right. You know, focus on a happy dad the last two years. How do you decide though, if something's worth putting your bandwidth into or not? Because we have the same issue. There's lots of things we could do, yeah. but you know, there's almost too much we could do that it stops us doing stuff. This is, this is the, yeah. I mean, this is the problem, the world that we're in because you guys have youth three, then you have friends who give you ideas, you have fans who give you ideas, you have other partners, smart people in your lives that give you ideas, you have guests who give you ideas. This is the one thing, and I, I have the same issue every single day. I guarantee when I'm done, I look at my phone, someone sent me an idea about something. My uncle once told me this, and I've said this quote a million times, and I'm gonna always say, it, if you strike oil, keep drilling. And whatever it is, you know, to me, let's just go back to our main focus. Our main focus as a company is Happy Dad, 100% Happy Dad. Anything that we bring on board has to be tied to Happy Dad. Whether we sign a new podcast to Shots, Happy Dad. Um, new Talent to Nelk, Happy Dad. Um, a new product, Happy Dad. It's got to be connected to Happy Dad. And, um, you know, and if it's not, then it just doesn't make sense. There, there have been, I, I don't, I don't want to say names, but there have been, people who um who've reached out to us to sign over a podcast but they have big deals with like a big beer company and they're like hey like i could join the network they're huge huge podcasts but i can't promote happy dad because of my deal with the beer company i was like well we, we can't sign you then we're not we're not interested you've got to you've got to have that main thing and you've got to help that beef jerky helps happy dad it helps broaden our relationships with our retailers it helps us build a finally build a product on Amazon and have Amazon take us more serious. Um, you know, it helps us, you know, get into more stores, more convenience stores, the 7-Eleven, Circle K's, Gulp, all these other people. So, you know, everything that we do has to help that main thing because if you strike oil, keep drilling. And Happy Dad to me is a speed train and it's just moving. It's going a thousand miles an hour and some things could jump on some things fall off some people just don't ever make it on so board speaking of introducing new things and bringing people in you recently signed the money buys happiness podcast and i know that you know for whatever reason that didn't work out and then steiny's got his show uh what is it again uh, late, one, one night, one with, night with steiny that's it not late night um you know so, so how how does that work you know how did it work with money buys happiness and why do you feel that that didn't work out and then sort of what makes it different with Steiny and, and, and how do you envision sort of signing talent in the future? I think with Steiny's worked out because Steiny knows how to speak with our uh, existing audience. Um, yeah. Our ex existing audience, no matter what they want to say about Steiny, they're interested in Steiny. It's a great concept. You know, the fact of only getting chicks on and it typically goes a certain way. And, you know, he's very funny and like he'll have a girl on and it's like she'll be like, Steiny, you've literally asked me on a date six times and I've said no every single time. And he's just, you know, there's just the way yeah. it goes is, is very funny. And it's a it's a unique concept that I don't think I've seen before. I can't think of another show, you know, maybe other than Fresh and Fit or something like that, but it's still very different vibes. So I think it's extremely unique. You know, did he come up with that on his own? He did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah. He, he did that. I mean, uh, yeah, typical. Yeah. But he, he came out on his own. Um, we experimented. But we said, you know, you have a full, our full support. Everyone's got our full support. Um, it's how they will want to use it. Believe it or not, Steiny doesn't need to be babysat. He runs his podcast on his own. We don't need to micromanage Steiny. 
he doesn't really call me about guests or, um, you know, I mean, we introduced him a couple um, people to help him on the production side and the shots on the back end supports him on the back end side. Full send milk helps him with promotion and yeah. Steiny's got it from there. He's handles everything. I think we're in a baby uh, in, in a position right now where we're not in the babysitting, hand holding. You know, we'll provide our resources to you, and it's what you do as a creator. Um, where that's where Steiny's done a great job of. You know, we don't. You know, he just sends over the file. We don't even do the production. He found another production studio that does the production. And then they send the files over to the shots team. We do all the back end up, uploading and everything. And So that's an example of where it works really well. And then why would you say that Money Buys Happiness maybe didn't work so well? You know, I'm not quite sure. I don't know what, what, why um, that one didn't work. I've never really looked into it. They had our full support. They had the same support that Steiny and anybody else has had. Um you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe they just didn't know how to talk to our uh, audience. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people go into it with like the wrong impression. You know, like it's like, for example, something that springs to mind is like FaZe, for example, because I used to be heavily involved in, in that gaming community. Like if you were to join FaZe back in the day before they went public, before they sold out to the corporate people and stuff like that, you would gain, you know, 100,000 followers overnight, 200,000 subscribers. Your life was changed. You are in FaZe. And I think that people probably get the impression that like, I'm going to sign with Full Send. I'm going to gain 100,000 uh, followers on my personal Instagram overnight. People are going to love us. You know, we're instantly going to be successful. They're going to get us the biggest and best guests. And then when it happens and it sort of doesn't work like that naturally, because, you know, you would be wrong to expect that. Then there's like this, you know, feeling inside of them where it's like, well, this isn't what I thought it was. So now I'm unhappy. And then when they're unhappy, the partnership is destined to fail. Everyone wants to blame someone when it doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know, and sadly, it's always the people up top, you know, you always want to blame that, you know, it's to your point. It's like, he never got me Elon. I never promised you Elon, you know, like he didn't get me to a million subscribers overnight. I thought that's how it works. That's not how it works. Yeah, it's not easy to get to a million. Um, you know, and that's why I have a lot of respect for Steiny and what he's doing. Cause he's really doing this. He knows and he's not expecting this and it's just, it's all organically growing, you know? Yeah. I mean? He's doing well that every episode's banging. Like yeah. He's not, audio he's downloads. Not on views. Yeah. Even, even audio downloads are like, I, I, just, I was looking at his audio downloads the other day. Um, his audio downloads are very, it will barely, he barely promotes the Spotify or Apple and his audio downloads, you know, he's crushing it. I think I forgot the number. It was like something like almost a million downloads a month just on audio. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's, um, He's doing something well. And I think that that's just the thing with anybody who wants, but others too. I don't have time. My brother, Sam doesn't have time. Kyle doesn't have time. Steve doesn't have time to micromanage. Here's access to our resources. Here's the blueprint. You go do it. Just like Kyle did. Kyle was already big before he met me. Kyle did it on his own. Steve was big, you know, I mean, until he met Kyle, but Steve had a vision. Kyle helped him execute the vision, provided him the resources. Steve yeah, executed. I, love, I love what Kyle did with Steve. Like it's just, it's such a great mm -hmm. story. And, and, you know, Kyle, I mean, it's, uh, Steve really turned it into a success. Yeah. It's crazy. Steve had a vision. Kyle helped him execute it, provide him all the resources. Steve did it. Like, wasn't yeah. this guy just like living in a house with like 10 friends, you know, no money, like the worst mm -hmm. of worst situations. I don't and know if it was 10 friends. I think maybe family. I don't know. I don't know exactly where he was at the time, but, but yeah, it was not the best situation, but he had a vision. He wanted to be that guy that would do anything. Kyle provided him resources. They did it. You know, it's like. And I like, like how he's transitioned it as well, though, because it started out with, oh, this guy can down a whole bottle of tequila in, you know, 20 seconds or whatever. But like now he's not really doing that, but yeah. people still love him, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can't down a bottle of tequila every day in 20 seconds for no, the rest not, of your life. Yeah, not dead, at mate. 24 years old. Yeah, no, no. no that, he doesn't even like to do that. He's, uh, and I think he's going to bring his podcast back. He wants to, he's very passionate about doing a podcast. So him and his uh, girlfriend, Selena, or fiance, Selena, are mm. going to do a podcast together. But yeah, I think that's it. You know, it's, you know, we, you have access, you know, even if we do this MMA podcast, we're not going to babysit and micromanage it. Here's our access to our resources. Here's everything. 110 employees. You know what I mean? You have access to everybody, anything you want. Here you go. It's all yours, but don't call me. Oh, well, you know, you know, what about this? What about that? Like, you know, I don't have time to micromanage. Can you give us like a sneak peek of something that's in store for the future? And something you're excited about obviously we've talked about the jerky and some other things that you're doing but maybe something you haven't talked about yet uh, we, we talked about jerky that's a big one um more states with happy dad canada happy mm -hmm. dad canada 
Yeah. UK probably. UK, yeah. probably, not, probably not time soon. What gets you excited guys. right now when you wake up uh, in the morning and you're 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 passionate about something? What's that one thing that's work wise? Yeah. Or personal wise? Both. 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 I mean, on a personal side, I just love hanging out with my wife. It's one of my favorite things to do. We could do anything. We could just sit on the couch all day or go That's on a nice. hike. Yeah, that one's, I'm very fortunate there. But, um, you know, work-wise, I mean, there's just so many different pieces, right? There's Happy Dad, the beverage. It's always innovating, always growing, more distribution, getting to more stores, more partners. Um like I just got an email yesterday, like we just got into 20 Bristol farms in California. It's like a high end grocery chain in Southern California. You know, like cool things like that are awesome. More and more Circle K's, more and more 7-Elevens, better relationship with Walmart, um, getting to more Walmart stores because we're only in Walmart, Florida, but we're going to be in Walmart in 20 something states in the next few months. There's, you know, then getting more states, you know, um, Canada getting jerky other products i think there'll be other happy dad products then there's happy dad merch there's full send merch mm -hmm. um there's the content you know like steve's podcast i'm very excited about more podcasts steinies is doing great full Send's doing great um we have mike tyson's podcast pivot podcast qb room uh, i think we're at like 10 podcasts right now um you know so i think more podcasts i mean there's a lot i mean i walk in the office most of the teams, I, my, my office is right next to, like, right in the front of the office. So, like, I just see the entire team when I walk in. As soon as I walk in, I can walk in any time in the morning, 7.30, 8.30, 9.30, and the office is just buzzing. Everyone's just working. And I think that's really, like, long weekends for me these days, you know, I don't mind them because it means hanging out with wife. But then sometimes I just can't wait to get back to the office because the office is just always buzzing. And I love that. So building on that, we don't normally do this, but I, I do just want to do it because you intrigue me. So when is enough enough? Oh, you're bringing back the old question. Yeah, I'm, I'm just very curious as to what it would be. So the hustle and bustle, you know, the way things are going, you're loving it. So when is enough? enough there's no end game for me because i work i love everyone i work with so it's i don't know when you know enough it's not work is not really work to me um i love everyone i work with i love my partners i don't think let's just say let's say we sell this company we, we, all, we all joke about this me kyle steve my brother we sell this company the first thing we want to do <laughs> Like, let's just say we sell this company for a ridiculous amount. What's like a that, ridiculous amount? I don't know. Ridiculous, like stupid amount, like a, like an unheard of number. Let's just mm -hmm. say we sell this for $50 billion, mm -hmm. you know, a ridiculous, stupid, unheard of amount. I don't know what company's ever sold for $50 billion. Uh, that's a non-tech company. Um, what we would want to do is buy islands right next to each other. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, that's what we talk about. Like, we would all, like the four of us would always want to be next to each other you know i think we'd always be we would probably do the next thing together um we just you know like i don't know maybe we would go and buy you know a company like elon did and rebrand it and make it our thing and have fun like you do with yeah. with x you know um i don't know what we, you know but i don't know when enough is enough i mean i don't think there'll ever be a day where i'm gonna say i'm done i'm just gonna go I used to think this way that I'm going to end up on a ranch somewhere and I'm going to do nothing but raise animals. I'm going to have that, but I don't think I'll, I'll always, I think, be doing something, but it might be something fun. Just you know, when was it? On the private island. What, yeah. Yeah. Maybe a ranch on the private island. Maybe, maybe, maybe. We want, yeah. But, but, I mean, you know, but I think, you know, I don't know when enough is enough because I'm, I don't think I'm at that close to that point yet. So I don't, I don't know. And, but I think I've been asked that question four or five times and I think I've given four or five different answers. It always changes as well. So I don't know. I don't know. I so think that's one of our best answers. I was gonna say who else is asking you our famous question? I I, I get well I, I maybe <laughs> not on stealing our IP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not on podcasts, but yeah, people yeah. always ask me when's enough enough. And yeah. I d I don't know. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that because you know, I'm having way too much fun right now. It's not like I'm working my ass off and I'm tired and I can't wait till the day I don't have to work. Mm -hmm. I love everything that i do i love my partners i love the products i love the fan base i love the staff i love everything about it i love doing the you know coming on podcasts and talking about this i i know when i come on podcasts we're gonna be talking business and that like i love that if you guys said hey let's come here let's talk about every single nelk video or you know yeah. you know let's review every old justin bieber song i'd be like yeah you know. but you know with the fact that we're talking business i love that i love also love the other thing that I love is 
I love being an example for other people to do what we're doing. And that's what I really, you know, whenever I come on a podcast like this or many of the other podcasts is the goal is for somebody to listen and be like, all right, I'm doing this. Um, whether they create our competition or create something completely different, whatever it is, I know someone's listening and, you know, I, I come in here very transparent. I didn't, I shared every secret that we had. Um, I and I, you've inspired Tom as well. I don't know if you want me saying this or not. Are you okay? I don't know what you're going to say, but go for well, it. Well, Tom said before you came in that you're one of his idols, which obviously he's he watched was, all your content for years. He was years. very nervous. He was shaking I, a little bit. I nerd out in that small space where business and creators meet. Like I could talk about it forever, all day, every day. I just love it. And you're clearly one of the pioneers in that space, pushing it forward. So uh, yeah, I was really excited to, to meet you. And um, thank you as well, I guess, for paving that way for all the creators coming up now and the entrepreneurs that are one day going to partner with those creators. They can now do certain things they couldn't do before because of you. Of course, well, thank, thank you for you. coming on as yeah, well. Of course, Much yeah, appreciate yeah. It. I think uh, this is going to be, you know, I want to keep doing that. I think that's what I love doing is yeah. what you just said. Like, I just want to keep, you know, one time I talked about doing a book on this um, and I was about to do it, write a book about it and, um, someone convinced me not to. Someone's like, hey, don't do a book. Instead, do a YouTube channel. You know, that way you could always update it. But then YouTube channel, what you guys do is a lot of work, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, but I, you know. Well, I, I want a copy when it's when it's ready. Yeah, if, yeah, if yeah, it yeah, 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 we'll see. But if not, we'll do something. But, you know, my goal is hopefully everyone who listened, um, and maybe we even clip this last five minutes of like everyone that's listened, go and do something. This stuff, it, it's a lot of work to create a brand but it's possible, you know, that, that, that's the beauty it's possible. And you, and that we're not the only example. Prime's a great example. Mr. Beast is a great example. Um, a lot of these creators that have created their makeup brands, great example, Bradley Martin and what he's done in the gym space. Great example. So it's a lot of great examples. We're not the only one and only difference between them, the group that's done it and the group that has, hasn't done it is the group that hasn't done it yet. hasn't just really found that one thing yet. Once that thing, you know, clicks in it's game over for that creator awesome if you guys have enjoyed this video as much as us or podcast make sure to smash that thumbs up button for the youtube algorithm and we will see you next wednesday with a brand new episode so it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from all of us thank you guys <laughs> thanks man oh I that was that. great yeah Ooh. i actually really enjoyed that that was one of